Hello and welcome to your 3GS course. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Ahmed Shurafa. I work as a React front end developer. At the beginning of my teaching of the 3GS library was in groups, and now I decided to do a comprehensive course with the latest 3GS updates on everything related to this library. Honestly, teaching has always been a passion, and after you finish this course, you will be able to do everything that comes to your mind related to this field. So through the 3GS library, you will be able to upload 2D and 3D graphics on the web by only writing a few lines of code. These lines of code are executed very quickly inside the graphics card. In PCs, the graphics card is located separately from other hardwares. And with the technological development, especially in the smartphones world, also phones have a graphics card, but the graphics card is integrated with the processor. Thus, phones can easily display any 2D or 3D graphics. As the technical development is geared toward areas that deal with 3D designs, these fields are like the field of virtual reality, which is known as VR and AR or 3D websites field. In this course, we will talk about one of these fields, which is the 3D websites field. The 3D websites deviate from the traditional pattern of sites. This technology made the site better as interaction with the user and give him a more description of the idea to be presented. Okay, let's see what we will learn in this course. This course will be divided into three sections. The first section, which is the introduction section. This section consists of 20 lessons. The basics of this library are explained, starting with how we can do and prepare our 3GS scene, and how we can add objects inside the scene, and then start animating the object. Also, we will talk about lights, shadows, particles, and the most important, which is how to add a 3D model, and how to add animation and how we can animate our model. In addition to our study of these topics, we will share the secret of some projects so that we can be familiar with the most of the ideas in this field. This was the first section. The second section, which is the shader section. Every 2D or 3D design has been put on the web with the help of a shaders program. This section consists of Eight lessons. Through these lessons, we will learn a new language, which is GLSL language. We will learn about the components of the shaders program, and how to write the shader code, and how to use our knowledge in this language so we can do immersive and creative websites. And in the last section, we will be sharing some of the website secrets. From time to time, we will do some projects applying everything we learned in the previous lessons. Shaders will also allow us to modify 3GS materials so that we can turn our model into the next level. In this project, we will learn how to add sounds and video texture. Also, we are going to add audio reactor which is making objects moves with sounds. When you finish this course, you will be able to enter the labor market with ease. So that's all, and I will see you in the first lesson. In today's lesson, we are going to talk about what is a 3JS and what is WebGL in general. Okay, let's start with the definition of WebGL. WebGL stands for Web Graphic Library, which is low-level JavaScript API. Okay, but what do we mean by API? API stands for Application Programming Interface, and it is the interface of the website, meaning that before I enter the site, I must pass through it, and its main job is that it is an intermediary between the user and the service to be accomplished regardless of the details. Imagine that you are going to buy a phone from a mobile store. Do you care how the phone is made or what are the materials used in its manufacture? Of course, no. You only care about buying the phone. 
The user here is the guy who want to buy the phone. The mediator is the API, which is the shop owner. The service to be accomplished is for the shop owner to go to the store and bring your phone. Okay, let's take it from a programming point of view. Imagine that you have built a calculator application and the user came to use this calculator. Does he care about how it made or the programming language is used to build it? No, since the calculator is working fine and there is no issues, the user will not care about anything else. And you, as a programmer, when you want to change what is inside one of the HTML elements, for example, you have an H1 tag and inside this tag, some word, and you want to change it. As soon as you type document, you are communicating with the DOM API and you can access any element with one of the document methods, such as query selector, and it change what is inside it by using text content. Do you care what's happening in the background in order to reach the element? Of course no. And we have several types of API, but their working principle is the same. Okay, let's back to the WebGL, which is, as we said, is a low-level JavaScript API allows you to display 2D and 3D graphics by placing points and then drawing lines and all three lines together will form a triangle. And by repeating this process several times, we will have the shape of the design inside the canvas. This process will be so fast because it's done via the graphics card. The graphics card will do calculations a little slower than the CPU, but the strength of the graphics card is that it performs thousands of calculations at the same time, unlike the CPU, which will execute the code line by line. Okay. Let's explain in more detail what we talked about here. When you want to use WebGL without any frameworks, then you need to manually specify each point location in the 3D space. For example, I want to create the first point, which has a location X, Y, Z, and second point, and third point, and so on, until I finish distributing all the points to form the required model. And then I have to tell him to draw a line between A and B, and then draw another line between B and C, and also a line between C and A. So I will have my first triangle. In the same way, I form another triangle, and another one here, until I finish preparing the model. The next step is to give each point a specific color. For example, each of the points A, B, and C give them a gray color, and so on until I finish all the points. In the end, the model will look like this. WebGL is written in two languages. The first language is JavaScript, and it is responsible for controlling the drawn model. So when we finish drawing the model inside the canvas, if you want to move it to the right or to the left, or do you want to rotate it, all of this is done using JavaScript. As you know, that the JavaScript code is executed inside the CPU. Okay. And the second language is OpenGL GLSL shading language, which has two functions. To put each point in its position, as we saw in the example, and to give each point a specific color. And this will be accomplished using vertex shader and the fragment shader. And this code will be executed inside the GPU. And now, we don't need to know more than this. In shader section, we will know in detail how this process will happen. Okay. This is what we mean by WebGL. And now, what is the job of the 3JS in this process? The process of manually locating each point in the 3D space and giving each point a specific color will take me a lot of time. And this is where the 3JS job comes in. 3JS library is a JavaScript API. It contains ready-made codes, so I don't have to write my shader code. And as we said, this code will specify the color and position for each point. We have something called Custom Shader, which is a program written by the 3GS team. This code will do this process completely by itself. For example, if I want to make a sphere or a cube with a few lines of code, the sphere or the cube will be drawn. And we also can write our shader program, and you can see the amazing things that you can do through the shader program. As we saw in the introduction, that we have a specific section for shaders, that we will talk about all of that in detail. And the last thing, if you want to see the websites that have been made through 3GS, you can go to their website 
and take a look at the things that you can do through this library. And I wish that your project will be one of them shortly. That was all for today, and see you in the next lesson. In today's lesson, we will make our first project, a very simple project, which is a cube drawn inside a canvas. We will use the 3JS library to help me and save me time in doing this project. Let's start our first step, which is that we go to the place where I want to create the project folder. And from there, I want to create a new folder for the project. You can name the folder whatever you want, but I want to name it HelloCube. And then, we want to open the folder that we created in the code editor. I'm using the Visual Studio code as a code editor, and of course you can use any code editor you want. So I will open the Visual Studio code, and I want to open the folder that I created by going to File, then I select Open Folder, then we choose the folder that we created, which is HelloCube. Then we press on the select folder. Okay, now I want to create three files by pressing on the new file, and the first file I want to create is the HTML file. But first, I have to give the file a name, for example, index, and we can decide on the file format after the dot. So if we wrote JS, then the file will be a JavaScript file. And if we wrote CSS, then the file will be CSS file. And if we wrote HTML, then the file will be HTML file. Okay, so as we said that we want to create three files, the first file is the HTML file, and the second file is the CSS file, so we press on the new file, and I want to name it styles.css. And the third file, which is the JavaScript file, and I want to name it index.js. Okay, the next step is that I want to link these files together. So I want to link the CSS file and the JS file inside the HTML file. So we go to the HTML file, and then we press Shift with the number 1 to use the emit tool. Then I will go to the title tag and name the project HelloCube. Now I want to link the CSS file inside the HTML file, and this will be done by using the link tag. Inside the href, we specify the file location. Now since the CSS file and the HTML file are both in the same location, we can write the CSS file name directly, which is styles.css. And in the body tag, we want to link the JS file by using the script tag. And then we write the JS file name in the source attribute. Let's give the JS file another name, for example, script.js. Now I want to make sure that I link these files correctly. So inside the CSS, I will do any style. For example, I want to change the body background color to black. And in the JS file, I will console.log hello cube. Okay, now to see how our page will look like on the web, we have to open a live server. So we have to install an extension named live server and we can find this extension in the extensions by typing the extension name in the search bar, which is Live Server. This is the extension that we want. I already have it, but if you don't have this extension, you will find an install option here, so click on it, then the extension will start downloading. Okay, good. So after installing the Live Server, go to the HTML file, I press right click and then choose open with live server. This is how our page will look like on the web. As you can see that the page color has changed to the same color that I chose. So now I will know that the CSS file has been linked correctly. And then we have to open the developer tool to check if the JS file has also been linked. We have several ways to open the developer tool. The first way is by pressing F12 so we got the message in the console, and the code was executed. And the second way is by pressing right click, then choose inspect. So I will get all that I have wrote in the HTML file inside the elements. So from here, I choose the console, then I will notice the same thing, that the code has been executed. So now we are ready to start creating our first 3JS scene. Okay, now we want to install the 3JS library, so we go to the 3JS website, which is 3JS.org. And from here, 
we click on the download. Then the folder will start downloading. This is the folder. After the download has finished, it will be a compressed folder with the name 3JS slash master. I want to grab the folder and put it inside our project. And from here, I want to extract the folder. But before we extract it, I want to create a new folder and name it 3. Then we put the compressed folder inside of it. And we can extract the folder by choosing the folder and then press right click and select extract here. Delete the compressed folder, we don't need it. Then open the folder. We will find a bunch of folders. I'm only interested in one folder and that folder is the built folder, which is responsible for building any project. And inside of it, I will find a bunch of files and these files contains the 3JS library. The first file, which is the 3.js. If we open this file, we will find out how the code has been written. As you can see that the file contains functions, variables, objects, and down here, we have also classes. And all of these codes were written to save us time. The following file, which is the 3.min.js, and the min word is short for minimize. This file is the compressed version of the 3.js file, meaning that this file is the same as this file, but it got minimized or compressed, and thus its size has been decreased. So if we open the file, we can notice that this is a JavaScript code written next to each other to reduce the file size. We have so many sites that can compress your code. One of these sites is the minifier.org. Firstly, we have to specify the code written language, and then we write any script code. Let me just repeat this code several times. And after we finish writing our code, we press minify. Here telling us that the file size before the compression was 988 byte, and after the compression, it became 854 byte, so you saved 134 byte. If you have many lines of code, you will see a bigger difference in size. Okay, let's back to our topic. We said that the 3.min.js is the compressed version of a 3.js. We are going to use the compressed version because it's smaller. So I want to copy the file and put it beside our files. This step is an optional because of course you can access the file without changing its location. Now I want to add this file to our project. And since the file format is .js, I have to add it via script tag. And in the source attribute, we specify the file location. So we write 3.min.js. As you can see, that I added the 3.min.js file above the script.js, above our main script. All my work, our written code, will be inside the script.js. So when I loaded the 3.min.js above the script.js, I got access to everything that is inside the 3.min.js if from inside the script.js file. Because as we know, that the codes got executed line by line, starting from the first line to the last line. Okay, now let's go to the script.js, delete the console, we don't need it anymore, and now it's time to know if I link the 3.min.js correctly or not. If I linked it correctly, then I can use the main variable in this library, which is the 3 variable. We go to the console to check if I got something, and since it does not give me any error, everything I have done so far works correctly. Now let's talk about the three variable. It's a variable containing variables, objects, methods, and classes. And we can reach anything inside this variable by using the dot notation. So you can imagine that the three variable as a big object, and inside of it are objects and methods. And we can reach to anything inside this object by using the dot notation, just like objects in JavaScript. For example, I have an object named username, and inside this object, I have a name as a key, and the value is Ahmad. 
and age with a value of 3, we also have a schools object, and inside the schools object, we have first school with a value of first, and second school with a value of second. And now if I want to print what's inside the first school, simply, I will enter from the username to schools to first school. And that will be done by writing console.log username.schools.firstschool. Now in the console, I can see first. And this is the same principle with the three variable. A big object containing objects, methods, variables, and classes. As you can see that we have here ambient light class, we also have animation clip class, and so on. We will talk about these classes in detail when we come to their lesson. This was a quick illustration of the three variable. Now let's get acquainted with the basic elements of any 3JS scene and understand the function of each element in them. Any 3JS project consists of four main elements. The first element is the scene. The second element is the objects. The third element is the camera. And the fourth element is the renderer. These elements are always present in any 3JSA project. Okay, to make it easier for ourselves to understand these elements, imagine with me what I will tell now. You are now inside your room and holding a camera in your hand and inside your room, you have a ball and a computer screen and right behind you is your phone. If you want to take a picture from the camera, logically, we will have the elements within the range of vision of this camera. In this case, it is the ball and the computer screen. The phone will not appear in the picture because it is not within the range of the camera's vision, but it is still inside the room. Okay, any camera takes a picture when we press a button on the camera. Assume that the button is in this place, then the final image will be the ball and the computer screen. Your room is the scene, the place where this photo was taken from the place where the action happened. The objects are everything in your room or in the scene, and the number of objects in this example is a three objects, the ball, the computer screen, and the phone. The camera is the same camera with which the scene was shot, and the renderer is the process of drawing the image taken from the camera onto the canvas. Once you press the button on the camera, the photo will be taken. Then the WebGL renderer will draw this image on the canvas. It is that simple and there is no complication in it. Okay, I have a question. Is the phone in the scene? Is the phone in your room? Yes it is, but the phone will not appear because it is not within the range of the camera's vision. Okay. Let's now apply everything we just learned. Let's delete the console and start writing the four elements we just talked about. The first element is the scene. The second element is the objects. The third element is the camera. And the fourth element is the renderer. Let's start with the scene. We instantiate the scene by writing constant scene is equal to a new 3.scene. This is how we create the scene. The second step is to create the object and then add it to the scene. But before we create the object, let's know from what does the object consist of. The object in a 3JS world is called a mesh. Okay, now any mesh that I want to create must contain two main things. The first thing I have to do is to specify the shape and dimensions of the mesh. And that meaning, is the shape of the mesh circular, triangle, or square? And after I define the shape, I must define the dimension of the mesh. So, if I want a circular mesh, I must specify the value of the radius for this circle. And if I want to create a cube mesh, here it is called box, then I have to specify the width, height, 
and depth for this box. So this was the first thing that I have to specify in the mesh that I want to create, which is the shape and the dimensions of the mesh. And the second thing is to describe what this mesh is made from. This includes the color of the mesh and how the mesh will respond to the light and other things that we will talk about in detail in one of the next lessons. Okay, the shape and the dimensions, which is the first point, here it is called geometry. And the word before geometry describes the shape of this mesh. Here, the word before geometry is box, and what is meant by box is the cube. In other words, it is a polyhedron that has width, height, and depth. And the value of the angle between any two consecutive sides equals 90 degrees. So that shape will be either a cube or a cuboid. And the numbers inside the parentheses represent the length of these dimensions. Here we have 1, 1, and 1. Meaning that this box, its width is equal to 1, and its height is 1, and the depth value is also equal to 1. This is all what we have to know about the geometry. This was the first thing that we have to specify in our mesh. The second thing is the material. It is a description of the characteristics of this mesh. So any mesh must contain these two things, which are the geometry and the material. Okay, so as we said before, that we want to create our mesh. But first, we need to change its name from object to mesh. We won't say object, we will keep saying mesh throughout the course. First, I want to do the mesh section, and then I want to create the geometry, so I have to write constant geometry is equal to a new 3 dot box geometry. I choose the box, because in this project, we want to make a cube. And now, if I didn't write any values inside these parentheses, then the dimension of this cube will be by default, one for width, and one for height, and one for depth, as we saw in the example. But we want to write them down, so that we can remember their values. So now we created the geometry, and now we want to create the material. By writing, constant material is equal to, in you, a three dot, there are many materials that we can use, but we want to start with the simplest type, which is the mesh basic material. And inside the parentheses, we can change any property value by doing an object, and then we write the property name. I want to give the mesh a specific color, and that will be done by the color property. And then I write the color I want as a string. I want the purple color, so we write purple. Okay, now we have geometry and the material, and now it's time to create the mesh by writing constant mesh is equal to a new 3 dot mesh. And then I have to tell that this mesh is consists of this geometry and this material. And the last step is to add the mesh to the scene. We can add any object like a mesh by writing scene dot add and then we pass the mesh as we named it here. Okay, so first we created the scene, and then we created the mesh, and now we want to create the third element, which is the camera. In 3JS, we have several types of camera, and to see these types, we go to the documentation, and inside the search bar, we search for camera. These are all the types of cameras that are in this library. We will talk about these types in one of the next lessons, but now we will use one type of these cameras, which is the perspective camera. The perspective camera is located inside the three class, and we can use the camera by writing a new a three dot perspective camera. We can pass four arguments to this type of camera. The first argument is the field of view. The second argument is the aspect ratio. The third argument is the near value, and the fourth argument is the far value. Okay, let's see together this slide to understand these arguments. Okay, so, the way of how the perspective camera is working is similar to the human eye. The image is taken in the form of a vertical angle, and this angle is called the field of view. 
this angle will form a default plane. This plane has a width and a height, and the ratio between width and height is called the aspect ratio. The near value, you specify its value, which is the beginning of the vision range, and the far value is the end of the vision range. And that means that if you want to see any mesh, it must be within the range of the camera's vision. In other term, it must be between the near and the far. So any mesh that is less than the near value will not be visible, and any mesh that is more than the far value will also not be visible. So in order for the camera to see the mesh, this mesh must be between the near and the far. Let's see another example in which we understand these arguments more clearly. Okay, we want to start with the first argument, which is the field of view. The field of view, or the vertical angle, when I'm pointing with my mouse right now. When I start to increase the value of the angle, I notice that the angle also increases. But the far value starts decreasing. So this will allow the camera to see the meshes within a lesser range. And when I start decreasing the value of the field of view, I notice that the angle value decreases, but the far value increases. And this will allow the camera to see the meshes with a greater range. That's why in our practical life, when we want to see something far away from us, we start to almost close our eyes until we can see the thing. You are actually decreasing the field of view, so you can see the objects at a further range. Okay, now we want to see how the image will look like in the camera. We notice that the more we increase the field of view value, we can see more meshes, but within a shorter range. And the more I reduce the angle, the number of visible meshes becomes less, but within a longer range. The camera will take the image inside this orange frame, so all the elements in this frame will appear in the captured image. And any element outside this frame will not appear in the image. This type of camera has two main features. The first feature is that this type of camera senses the depth, meaning that the meshes close to the camera will be large, and the meshes far from the camera will be small. So this was the first feature, and the second feature is that will be a distortion occurs at the edges of the image. And what is meant by distortion is the farther away from the center of the camera's field of view, the meshes will begin to expand. So as we can see in this example, that the balls on the edges will feel as if their shape has become oval, while the big ball in the middle did not get any change. This was the distortion in a nutshell. Always try to put the meshes close to the center of the camera so that you don't have any distortion. Okay, the second argument, which is the aspect ratio, it is the image width divided by the height of the image. And the last two arguments are the near and the far. The near is the beginning of the vision range, exactly where I'm pointing with my mouse cursor. And the far is the end of the vision range, exactly where I'm pointing with my mouse cursor. Okay, let's start creating the camera by doing the camera section, and then write constant camera is equal to a new three dot. As we said that we are going to use the perspective camera, and the first argument is the field of view. We will use 75, and the three JS in the background will convert this value to degrees. The next argument is the aspect ratio. We will use the aspect ratio in the camera and the renderer, as we will see soon. Let's create the aspect as an object, so all elements will have access to this object. Also, if we want to change the aspect value, we can change it from one place, instead of me going through each element and changing them. Okay, so first, I will write width, and here we want to specify the image width. We want the width and height of the image to cover the entire screen. So we have to write window.inner width and we instantiate the height, but the value will be window.inner height. The window.inner width will give me the entire width of the screen, meaning this entire width. And the window.inner height will give me the entire height of the screen, meaning this height. 
Now I can write the aspect ratio in this way, which is aspect dot width divided by aspect dot height. And the last two arguments are the near and the far. If I don't specify their values, by default, their values will be 1 and 2000. 1 is the near value, and 2000 is the far value. Let's write it as a note here, so we can remember it. And the last step is to add the camera to the scene, by writing scene.add camera. Okay, so first, we created the scene, and then we did the mesh. And the last thing we did is to create the camera. And now it's time to create the last element, which is the renderer. As we said that the renderer is responsible for drawing the image on the canvas. So after we took a picture from the camera, we need a place to render this image on. And we agreed that we want to display this image on a canvas. So we have to create the canvas element by going to the HTML file and instantiate the canvas with open and close tag. Let's give the canvas a class so we can reach to the canvas from inside the JS file. And we can reach the canvas by creating the constant. We can name the constant with any name. I will just name it canvas is equal to document.querySelector. And we write the class name as a string inside the parentheses. Of course, since it is a class, we must put a dot before the class name. The next step is to create the renderer, and it is also located inside the three class. The renderer name is WebGL Renderer. This is the API that we talked about in the previous lesson, which is responsible for drawing the model inside the canvas. But I have to pass the canvas name that will be drawn on. So I will write the canvas name as I name it here. If I change the canvas name to Canva, then I have also to change it from here. In ES6, if the property name is the same as the value name as we have here, here we have the key name is canvas, and the value name is also a canvas, then we can write this part like this, and this will give me the same result. Okay, the third step is to set the size of the image drawn on the canvas. Do you want the drawn image size to be the same as the image taken from the camera? We want them to be the same size, so we write renderer dot set size aspect dot width and aspect dot height. Pay attention here that we used comma instead of division. And the last thing to do is to write renderer dot render scene and camera. And what is meant by that is to display what the camera inside the scene has captured. Okay. Let's write the purpose of using each of these four lines. We wrote the first line to reach and select the canvas element. The second line is to add the WebGL renderer. The third line is to set the size of the renderer. And the fourth line is to display what the camera inside the scene has captured. Okay, and now if I want to see how our project will look like, we can see that the canvas took the entire width and the height of the screen. But we have two problems. The first problem is that the scroll bar is visible, so I have to hide it. And that will be done by going to the CSS file, and then choose the star. Any browser, either it is Chrome, Edge, or Firefox, will have a default styles, such as the margin and the padding. So all what we have to do is to change these styles. I will set the margin value to zero and the padding value to zero. And that means that I don't want any margin or padding on my page. Okay, the next step is to select the canvas and give it a position fixed so that it maintains its position when I'm scrolling. And I want its position to be at the left zero and on the top zero. Okay, now we hit the scroll bars. In some browsers, the scroll bars might still be visible. And to solve this problem, we have to go to the body and give it overflow hidden. But I don't recommend this solution because it will affect the content inside the canvas. In case you give the canvas a position fixed, but then you got a colored border on the edges of the canvas, then you can hide this border by going to the canvas 
and write outline none. So now we fixed and solved the first problem by hiding the scroll bars. The second problem is that I can't see the cube that I created. Any object that we create will be by default in the center of the scene, will be in the origin point. In my project, I created the mesh and the camera and they are both in the same position. So the camera is enabled to take any picture. To understand what I said more clearly, let's see this example. First, we created the cube and after we have created it, the default position will be in the center of the scene. And after that, we created the camera, which will also be positioned in the center of the scene. So if I saw what the camera will capture, I will notice that the cube does not appear inside this frame, simply because the camera is now inside the cube. So I'm going to move the camera back on the z-axis a certain distance until the cube is within the camera's vision. We will talk about the axis in more detail in the next lesson. I'm currently using 3D software called the Blender. I'm using it only for explanation. Okay, now if I want to see what will be captured by the camera, I will notice that the cube appears on the camera. And this is the same thing that we are going to do in our project. So we go to the camera section and change its position on the z-axis by writing camera.position.z is equal to 3. And as we said, that we are going to talk about transformations in more detail in the next lesson. Okay, if we go to our page, we can see our cube. But I see it as a square, not a cube. And the reason for that, when we put the camera back on the z-axis, the camera became facing the cube. And what is being displayed now is the front face of the cube. So in order to see the cube more clearly, I need to see the cube from the other side. And that will be done by either changing the camera's position or the cube's position. Let's change the camera's position again, but this time we will change its position on the x-axis by 1. And also change its position on the y-axis by 1. Then the final look of the cube will be like this. Okay. I hope you have understood our lesson for today because this lesson is the basis for all future lessons. And if there is a specific part that you did not understand, I hope that you will mention it in the question section and I will gladly answer your question. Okay, so this was everything for today and see you in the next lesson. In this lesson, we are going to learn how to do a transformations for objects. And what is meant by objects are the three JS elements, such as meshes, camera, scene, and the renderer. And we are also going to learn if we can do the transformation to all objects or some of them. To answer this question, we have to go to the documentation and search for object 3D. The answer for our question is simply that if the object inherits from the object 3D class, then this object will take access to the properties and methods in the object 3D class. If you have studied object-oriented programming, then you already understood what did I just said. And if you didn't know what is object-oriented programming, then let me simplify it for you. Suppose there is a father who decided to distribute his property to his children. So every son will be among the inheritors from this father. The father in this example is the object 3D class and the father's property is the properties and the methods. And now we want to know who the sons of this father are. But before that, we want to know what do we mean by object 3D class. It is a class written by the makers of this library and any object inherits from this class will take an access to the properties and methods inside this class. Okay. How to know if the objects inherit from the object 3D? And simply the answer is by searching for the object name. For example, I want to check if the mesh inherits or no. Okay, I reached the mesh. What is written here? Object 3D, which is mean that I can apply the properties and methods inside the object 3D on the mesh. Okay, let's move to the next element which is the camera. 
Also, at the top, we can see that we have object 3D, which is mean that we can also apply the properties and the methods inside the object 3D class. Let's see the next element, which is the renderer. And here we can see that we don't have object 3D class, so the renderer doesn't inherit from the object 3D class. And this is very logical, because as we said in the previous lesson, that the job of the WebGL renderer is to draw the image taken from the camera on the canvas. Okay, let's now see what we have inside the object 3D. As we said before, that we have properties and methods, we will study the most used of them. So let's start with the first property, which is the position. The way to express the position is in the form of the vector 3. And what is meant by vector 3 is the location of the element in relation to the origin point by writing three values with the same number of axes, the x-axis and the y-axis and the z-axis. And to understand more about what vector 3 is, let's see the slide. As we said, vector 3 is a description of an object in relation to three axes. And we started with the first property, which is the position property. So vector 3 here will describe the position of the object in relation to the three axes. And we start calculating the distance from the origin point. The origin point is the point where the three axes intersect. And the three axes is x axis, y axis, and the z axis. This is the x axis, and this is the y axis, and this is the z axis. In the y axis, the more we go up, the value increases, and the more we go down, the value will decrease. In the x axis, the more we go right, the value increases, and the more we go left, the value decreases. In the z axis, the more an element moves toward us or gets closer to us, the value increases. And the more an element moves away from us, the value will decrease. Now in this case of this mesh, it moves right on the x-axis, so its value on this axis is 1. This mesh, it approaches us on the z-axis by 1, and it goes up on the y-axis by a value of 1. Thus, expressing it in vector 3 will be in this form. The first place is for the x-axis, the second place is for the y-axis, and the third place for the z-axis. And according to the given example, the value of x is 1, y value is 1, and the z value is also a 1. Let's repeat what we just said. The x-axis is the red colored line, and the z-axis is the green colored line, and the y-axis is the blue colored line. Now we want to move the mesh on the x-axis by 1. Then the mesh location will be here. Of course, the more distance we move to the right, the greater the value. And the more distance we move to the left, the lower the value. On the z-axis, the more distance the mesh moves toward us, the greater the value. And the more distance the mesh moves away from us, the lower the value. On the y-axis, the more distance the mesh moves to the top, the greater the value. And the more distance the mesh moves to the bottom, the lower the value. Now, for example, I decided to move the mesh on the x is equal to plus 2, and move it on the y, a distance is equal to plus 2, and also we want to move the mesh, a distance on the z-axis is equal to plus 3. So its position will look like this, and the vector 3 for this cube is 2, 2, and 3. 2x, 2y, and 3z. Let's ask a question. Does the cube in the canvas will look like this? The answer is no because I'm only interested about the image coming from the camera that the renderer will display. And if I came to see what picture was taken from the camera right now, we will notice that nothing appears. So I have to change my camera position to see the cube. First, I have to move it on the z-axis, and move it again on the y-axis, and then move it on the x-axis. Now we will notice that the cube became within the range of the camera's vision. So this is the image that will be sent to the WebGL renderer to be drawn on the canvas. Now let's back to the project and apply what we have learned. But before that, we want to specify what objects inherit from the object 3D. And as we saw, they are only two objects, the mesh 
and the camera. We want to try that on our mesh by writing mesh dot position and then where we want to move it. On any axis, we want to move it. Let's move it on the x axis by the value of 1. We can see that the mesh moved 1 on the positive x axis. If we want to move the mesh upward, then we have to write mesh dot position dot y is equal to 1. So the mesh moved up by 1 on the positive y. And in the same way, we can move the mesh on the z axis by writing mesh dot position dot z is equal to 4. Let's see where the mesh is located now. As we can see, we no longer can see the mesh, but why is that? Because if you could remember what we said in the previous lesson, it is that in order for the cube to appear, it must be within the range of the camera's vision. The location of the camera right now is in the z equal to 3, while the cube is on the z-axis is equal to 4. So the cube is now behind the camera. But if you decrease the z-value of the cube and give it a value of 2, then the cube will start appearing. And if we decrease the value again, we can see the cube more clearly. Okay, let's now try that on the camera by moving it on the x is equal to 1. So the camera moved one unit to the right. Let's move it again, but this time on the y is equal to 1. Then the location of this camera will be facing the cube. This is the first property we have in the object 3D class, which is the position. Let's now get back to the object 3D class and see what is the next property that we will talk about now, which is the scale. As you can see, the scale is also expressed in vector 3 format. Okay. What is the scale? The scale makes me stretch or shrink the mesh. If I want to scale up the mesh on the x-axis, the mesh will start looking like this and will shrink on the same axis if the value is decreases. The value for the scale on any mesh will be 1 by default on the three axes. If we give any axis a scale value higher than 1, then the mesh will start stretching on that axis. And if we give any axis a scale value lower than 1, then the mesh will start shrinking on that axis. If we give the cube a scale value on the y-axis higher than 1, then it will start stretching. And when the scale value is lower than 1, then the cube will start shrinking. And the same thing will happen on the z-axis. Now let's see the effect of the scale on the cube. First of all, before we adjust the scale value, the cube dimensions will be as we specified. And the scale value by default will be 1 on the x-axis, and 1 on the y-axis, and 1 on the z-axis. Now I want to change the scale value for the x-axis and make it equal to 2. The cube is stretched on the x-axis, and its width is double the previous width. And when we scale the cube on the y-axis by a value of 3, it will stretch its width twice the previous width. A scale is a very simple property and there is no complexity in it. Let's see the third property, which is the rotation. The way to express rotation is in the Euler form. In order to understand the rotation clearly, let's see this example. First, in order to know in which direction the cube will rotate, you should imagine what I'm going to say. In order to know in which direction the cube will rotate, imagine that you are holding a stick in your hand and we want to pass it through the cube. The direction of this stick is in the same direction as the axis on which I want to rotate the cube. For example, there is this cube and I want to rotate it on the x-axis. So I grab this stick and put it in the same direction as the x-axis. And then I drag it inside the cube like this. But now you need to imagine what the logical rotation of this cube is. Is it possible to move in this direction? Of course no, the stick will prevent the cube from moving in this direction. Therefore, the rotation of the cube on the x-axis will not be in this direction. Let's see if the cube will rotate like this. The stick will also prevent the mesh from rotating like this. Let's see the third movement in this direction. 
This is the logical rotation of the cube on the x-axis. So when I rotate the cube on the x-axis, the cube will rotate in this direction. Okay, now if I want to rotate the cube on the y-axis, so firstly, I have to change the stick position and put it in the y-axis. In the same way, we want to imagine what is the logical probability of rotating the cube. Will the cube rotate like this? No, not like this. The stick will prevent the cube from rotating like this. So this is not the logical rotation. As we said, that the cube will rotate like this when the rotation is on the x-axis. Let's see other direction. Also, this will not work. Let's see the third rotation direction. We notice this is the logical rotation direction for the cube when we rotate it on the y-axis. Let's try the last rotation, which is on the z-axis. First, we have to change the stick position to the z-axis, then I move it like this. And as we said, that this rotation is for the x-axis. Therefore, this is not the correct direction of rotation. Let's try this rotation direction. And we said that this rotation will be when we rotate the cube on the y-axis. So the right rotation direction will be like this, as you can see right now. Okay, now let's review the direction of rotation on the three axes. First, when we rotate the cube on the x-axis, the rotation direction will be like this. Imagine that the red line is the stick, then the rotation will be like this. Let's try the rotation on the y-axis, then the rotation direction will be like this. And on the z-axis, the cube will rotate like this. Okay, this is how we can know the rotation direction, and now I want to know how to make the cube rotate by a certain value. We have two ways to describe the direction of rotation and the value of rotation. The first direction, when I move clockwise. And the second direction, when I move counterclockwise. If we move counterclockwise, then we express the value as a positive. For example, we want to rotate 45 degree, or 90 degree, or 180 degree. And if we move clockwise, then we express the value as a negative. For example, we want to rotate minus 45 degree, or minus 90 degree. Okay, let's understand more. This circle represents the rotation value divided into four parts. Each part will rotate the mesh by a quarter of a turn. Okay, if I want to rotate the cube by a quarter of a turn, normally, we start from the zero when we didn't rotate the cube before. I want to rotate the cube in the first quarter. We express the magnitude of this rotation by 1.57. If I want to rotate the cube starting from the zero and rotate the cube by a half a turn, the value of the half turn is 3.14. If you remember what the 3.14 is, it is the same value as the value of the pi. So I can rotate the cube by half a turn by writing a value of rotation equal to 3.14 or by writing pi. And if I want to rotate the cube by 3 quarters of the turn, so the value of the rotation will be 4.71. Or by writing 3 multiply pi divided by 2, which is equal to 1.5 pi. If I want to do a one turn or a full turn, which is when the cube starts to rotate and ends at the starting point. Then the value will be 2 pi. This is all if you moved counterclockwise. Okay, now in case I start to rotate the cube clockwise, which is in this direction, we express the value of this rotation in negative. Okay, if we want to rotate the cube by quarter a turn, so we want to rotate by this amount. This rotation will be minus 90 degree, which is the same as minus 1.57. So each quarter is 90 degree, which is the same of 1.57. If we moved counterclockwise, the 1.57 will be positive, and if we moved clockwise, the 1.57 will be negative. Okay, let's now apply what we have learned. 
this was the last shape of the cube after the scale and to see the cube clearly I want to remove the scale on the y axis this is how we can see the rotation more clearly now we want to make the cube start to rotate ok so first we have to decide which object we want to apply the rotation on it which is the mesh and then we write the property which is rotation then we specify the axis on which we will rotate the cube which is the x axis is equal to math.py as we said that the math.py will rotate the cube by half a turn but I don't want a half a turn I want one eighth of the turn so we divide math.py by 4 or multiply it by 0.25 so the cube rotated like this if we want to see the cube before the rotation it was like this and after the rotation the cube became like this let's try to do a rotation on the y-axis by math.py multiply by 1.2 then the cube will look like this ok now we want to clarify the difference whether the value of the rotation is negative or positive let's now rotate the cube on the x-axis imagine that the red line is the stick that will pass through the cube now we will start to rotate the cube counterclockwise and that's mean that the rotation value is positive then the cube will rotate like this now if the rotation value is negative then I will start to move a clockwise then the cube will rotate in the opposite direction of the previous rotation direction and the same thing on the y-axis this is how the cube will rotate when I start to rotate counterclockwise and this is the rotation direction when I start to rotate clockwise and let's try that on the z-axis if I rotated the cube counterclockwise and in case I rotated the cube clockwise ok we have studied three properties which are the position and the scale and the rotation of course there are many other properties that we will talk about the most used gradually with the upcoming lessons now before we finish let's talk about two things the first thing is the group class the group class is that if I had more than one element then I can control them all at once for example if I have three meshes and I want to move them all together or rotate them all together so the group mesh is like a big box and then I will put meshes inside this big box and when I move the box everything inside this box will also move ok let's do the group class first we need to remove these codes we don't need them and then we need to add another mesh so I will create the geometry and decreate the material with a green color and also create the mesh and I want to move the mesh on the y axis by 2 and then we add it inside the scene now I want to instantiate the group after the scene constant group is equal to a new a 3 dot group now inside this group I want to add the first mesh and the second mesh I can add these meshes anywhere but it must be after instantiating the meshes so I can access these meshes so in the same way that I add objects to the scene I can add objects to the group by using the add method currently I don't need these two lines instead of adding the meshes inside the scene I can add them inside the group and then add the group inside the scene then the meshes will look like this now is the time to start moving them let's move them on the x-axis by 3 and bring them back and again move them to x1 and this is how the group class works the way it works is very simple and does not need an explanation more than this ok let's see now the other thing 
and it is in case you have a problem identifying the axes. This library made for us a set of classes regarding these types of problems, and the name of the class is Helper. First, I have to go to their website, and then I move to Documentation, and search for Helper. If you start asking yourself a questions, like where are the axes, where is the camera, I can see it. Then directly go to Helpers section. We have a lot of helpers that will simplify finding the objects. Let's see the axes helper and the camera helper. We will study the other helpers gradually when we reach their lesson. Here in the camera helper, after we create the camera, and we don't know where the camera location is, and also, if we want to know how much is the far, and the near value, and the field of a view value. So when I add the camera helper, then the camera will look like this. The red part is where the camera is located, and the beginning of the orange line is the near value, and the end of the orange line is the far value. This was the camera helper in a nutshell. Now let's see the axis helper. It is the helper responsible for determining the position of the axis. Let's try it in our project by first creating the axis helper section and then write constant axis helper is equal to a new 3 dot axis helper and then add it inside the scene. We notice that the axis appears here. Let's move the group so we can see the axis more clearly. The origin point is where I'm pointing now with my mouse cursor, and its value is 0x, 0y, and 0z. The axis helper accepts one argument. It should be a number, and it is to determine the length of these axes. For example, if I wrote 2, I notice that the length of the axis has increased. These axes length, by default, will be 1, and any value higher than 1, will increase the length of these axes. Let's try to increase the axis length to 4. So the axis length has increased. Okay, this was our lesson for today, and see you in the next lesson. Our topic for today is the animation. Any video is basically several images, but it is displayed very quickly, so it appears as a video. This is the same idea here. The image coming from the camera and drawn on the canvas is a single image. Therefore, if we repeatedly drawing this image on the canvas, the animation of an image will appear. Okay, before we get into the topic of the lesson, let's recreate the project again, so we can get rid of the difficulty of creating any 3 JSA project. Okay, you have inside the resource folder, startup folder, open it by using any code editor. And inside this folder, you will have four files, as you can see. In the HTML file, we have imported the 3GS library, and we also created the script file, and then I linked the CSS file. Also, the padding and margin are set to zero in the user agent sheet, which is the default styles for any browser. And inside the script file, I want to start creating our 3GS project. As we said, any 3JSA project consists of four main elements, which are the scene, mesh, camera, and the renderer. We want to create each one of them. Let's start with the scene by writing constant scene is equal to a new 3.scene. Now we want to create the mesh. The mesh, as we said, must consist of two things. The first thing is the geometry and created by writing constant geometry is equal to a new a three dot. And since I want a box, so I have to write box geometry and then choose the dimensions of this box. The second thing is the material and created by writing constant material is equal to a new a three dot. And now I want to choose the type of this material, which is, as we said, that we want to start with the first and simplest type, which is the mesh basic material. And then I choose a color for this mesh. And the last thing is to create the mesh by writing constant mesh is equal to a new 3.mesh. 
and then I point to the geometry and the material which was the reason for making this mesh. And then I have to add the mesh inside the scene. The third element, which is the camera. And we already know that the camera needs an aspect ratio, so I want to create this variable outside to use what is inside the aspect variable in more than one place. Also, if we decided to modify the values of the aspect variable, the modification from one place will be faster. First, we need the width to be window.inner width, which is mean that the canvas width takes the whole screen width. And the same thing will be done for the height. But instead of width, we have to write height. And that means that I want the canvas to take the whole screen height. And then I create the camera. I will choose the perspective camera. And we already know that this camera needs four arguments. Starting with the field of view. Then the aspect ratio. And the last two arguments will be 1 and 2000 by default. 1 is the near value and 2000 is the far value. We know that everything I create will be by default in the center of the scene. So I have to change the camera position by writing camera.position.z is equal to 3. And the last step, as usual, is to add the camera inside the scene. And now it's the renderer time. The first step is to choose the canvas, but first, I have to create the canvas inside the HTML page by writing canvas and give it a class so I can reach this element. Inside the script file, I can reach the canvas element by using a query selector method. But let me add the job of each line so that everything is clear and understandable. And then, we instantiate the renderer, and we will keep using one of the available renderers, which is the WebGL renderer. Then we specify the canvas that I want to draw on it. In ES6, if the key name is the same as the value name, I can write the object like this. Let me add here the job of this line. Now I want to specify the renderer size. I want the sizes to be the same as the camera aspect. Be careful, we only point to the values without dividing them. And the last step is to display what the camera inside the scene captured. After that, the cube will look like this. Okay, let's fix the canvas dimensions to hide the scroll. Select the canvas and change the position to position fixed and this specify its position as top 0 and left 0. Okay, let's check the console if we have any errors. We don't have any errors, so now our project is ready. To understand what is meant by animation, let's see this slide. First, we need to know the way that the code is being read. The code is read in order from the first line to the last line, and everything that is read is saved in something called a global context. You can imagine the global context as a big box, and each line being read will be saved inside this box. And to execute the code within any function, I first need to call that function. As you can see, that I only have one function, which is the animate function. Functions are like a small box, containing some codes. The animate function that I have contains two lines of codes. The first one is to print animate inside the console. And the second line, which is the request animation frame method. As you can see that I put the animate function inside this method. The request animation frame will call the animate function one time on each frame. So each frame that being displayed, the animate function will be called. The request animation frame is not something related to 3JS. Okay, but how do you know that? Simply because we reach to this method from the window object, and the window object is available on any browser. So based on that, we can use the request animation frame on any project. Okay, now what will happen when I call this function? 
the first thing will happen is to print the animate word in the console. Then it moves to the second line, which is the request animation frame. Then the animate function will be called once on each frame. If you have a device that will display the project at 150 frames per second, then the animate function will be called 150 times per second. And if you have another device that will display the project at 60 frames per second, then the animate function will be called 60 times per second on this device. As you can see, the first line is written when we did the console.log animate. The second line is the result of the request animation frame for the animate function. So each frame, the animate function will be called. And inside the animate function, we have console.log animate. So animate will be printed one time on each frame. Let's now apply what we learned in the project. First, we need to create the animate function. I will create the function in the R way, and of course you can create the function in any way, such as creating the function as an expression function. So choose the way that you will be comfortable. I'm comfortable with the arrow function, so I will choose it. And now we will do the console.log animate and the second line, which is from the window object, we choose the request animation frame method. And we pass the function that I want to call it once on each frame, which is the animate function. Let's see if we have any changes. There are no changes, because as we said, that any function needs to be called in order to execute the lines of codes inside the function. So I move down here and call the function. Okay, here we can notice that the first printed line is the animate word. And the second line, the word animate was printed once on each frame. And depending on the device that displays the project, the number of times the word animate is printed will vary. The devices that displays more frames will call the animate function more. So let's write this as a note here that some devices will call the animate function 60 times per second. And other devices will call the animate function 120 times per second. And of course, some devices will call the animate function higher or lower. But let's take the 60 and 120 as an example. The term given to the number of frames or the number of images being displayed per second is called FPS. And FPS stands for frames per second. So the FPS is how many frames are being displayed per second. And it's vary from device to another. Okay, let's back to the introduction that we mentioned in the beginning of the lesson. Which is that any video consists of many images being displayed at high speed so it will lock as a video. And I want to do the same thing. But first, I want to know what line is responsible for drawing the image taken from the camera and drawing it on the canvas. Okay, let's back to the lines. Is it the scene? No, as we said, that the scene is where the action is happening. The mesh is the objects, surely not this part. The camera will only capture the image, so the line is not in this part. Then the line I'm interested in is inside the renderer. From its name, renderer, it is responsible for rendering the image. The first line is for choosing the canvas. The second line is for adding the WebGR renderer. The third line is for setting the size of the renderer dimensions. And the fourth line from the renderer, we have a method called render, which is mean display display what the camera inside the scene captured. Let's write what this line of code does. So this is the line responsible for drawing the image inside the canvas. I will write this line inside the animate function so it gets executed once in each frame. So I remove this line from here and then move it inside the animate function. The second step is to do the change on each frame. If you want the cube to start moving inside the canvas, then the change must be in the position. And if you want the cube to start rotating, then the change must be in the rotation. Okay, I will write mesh.rotation.x plus equal 0.01. That means in each frame, 
increase the amount of rotating by 0.01 from the previous frame. Therefore, if I see what has changed on the cube, I will notice that the cube has started to rotate continuously on the x-axis. Okay, let's try to move the cube on the x-axis. Then the cube starts to move and we can see the distortion when the cube reaches the edges of the screen. Let's move the cube on the y-axis. Then the cube moved in this direction. Okay, let's back to the frame per second. As we said that the devices will call the animate function a different number of times than any other devices. In the first case, the function gets called 60 times per second. So if we calculate the distance it traveled by the cube on the x-axis, the distance will be 0.6 per second. In each second, the cube will travel 0.6 on the x-axis. In the second case, the cube will travel 1.2 on the x-axis. Here we have a difference in result. Each device will display a different result. And we want to get a similar result. Because this difference in results appeared as a result of one movement. And you can imagine how much difference it is if you have many animations. Or if you want to coordinate the appearance of a certain text in case the cube reaches a certain distance. This distance will vary from one device to another. So we must find a solution to this problem. To understand the solution to this problem, let's see the slide. Okay, let's see now what is the effect of the FPS difference from one device to another. We have two devices. The first device displays the project at 60 frames per second. And the second device displays the project at 120 frames per second. In the first device, after a second, the cube moved a certain distance. In the second device, after a second also passed, the cube moved twice the distance that the cube moved in the first device. Because the animate function is called twice more, then the cube moves twice as far. In the first device, the animate function got called 60 times per second. And in the second device, the animate function got called 120 times per second. As we said, the difference in result from one device to another is bad performance. To solve this problem, the 3GS build a class called the clock. The clock class is simply to link the result displayed to the user based on the number of seconds that have passed since the user enters the site or since the beginning of the project. Firstly, before the user enters the site, the value of the clock is zero. And after the user enters our site, the cube will move a certain distance and the value of this distance traveled will be the same on all devices. After another second, the cube will move the same distance on all devices regardless of the FPS value. Okay, let's use the clock class. First, we have to instantiate the clock class outside the animate function by writing constant clock is equal to a new 3 dot clock. Before we start the next step, let's remove these lines cause we don't need them. The second step is to reach the part responsible for calculating the number of seconds that have passed since the client or the user enters our site. And we can reach to that time by writing constant elapsed time is equal to clock dot get elapsed time. The value stored in the elapsed time variable will be the number of seconds that have passed since the user enters our site. Okay, let's print this variable in the console. We can notice that the value started from zero and gradually increased. These values are in seconds. Okay, but how we can use it? First, we have to remove the plus because we don't want to add a value above a value. We want the change to be related to the number of seconds that have passed. Okay, but before that, let's arrange our code and write what each line is used for. Here we must equalize it with the number of seconds. Thus, the movement of the cube is related to the number of seconds, not to the value of FPS. So the cube will give me the same animation on all devices. 
let's change the rotation to the y-axis. Okay, let's review the topics we studied in the previous lesson. We want to make the cube rotate half a turn every second. Simply, by multiplying the elapsed time by the math.py. As we understood in the previous lesson, that each pi in the rotation will rotate the mesh half a turn. So the cube will rotate half a turn every second. If we want to rotate the cube a turn by a second, then we have to multiply the pi by 2. I prefer to use the clock class because as we said, it unifies the result on all devices. That was all for today and see you in the next lesson. In today's lesson, we are going to talk about Webpack Bundler. Until now, we are loading the 3GS library by using a script file. And we can see that by going to the HTML file, we can see that we are loading 3GS as a JS file. This way has some limitations. One of these limitations is that this script does not contain some classes. Simply, because this library has so many classes. It is therefore difficult to put all these classes in one file. Even if we put all these classes in one file, the file size will be very large, even if we compress the file. The second problem is that any browser, either Chrome, Firefox, or Edge, it will also put restrictions on us for security reasons, and not everything we are allowed to do. One of these restrictions is that in one of the upcoming lessons, we will be putting textures on the model, and the 3GS in the background will handle these textures, and the browser does not allow you to do anything in the background. So, we need to run the project on a local server. These were some of the reasons to use the bundler. And to know what is meant by the term bundler, we need to see the slide. There are several types of bundlers, but first, we need to know what we mean by a bundler. A bundler is a tool that you download on your device. It receives different types of files from you, such as HTML file, CSS file, JavaScript file, and images. The bundler will take these files and then modify them. And the modifications are not made to the content of these files. For example, it does not modify the written code, but it will make the dealing with the project easier. It also allows you to run a local server, thus you can download modules and download other libraries in the same project. Also, through the bundler, you can deploy the project with ease, meaning that it is easy for you to upload the website on the web. The bundler we will be using is the Webpack bundler. Okay, why we are going to use Webpack? We are going to use Webpack for so many reasons. Most programmers use Webpack because it achieves most of their requirements. As we said, it allows us to run a local server. And then, I can download the dependencies I need. Secondly, the documentation is clear and shows you how to download it without any complications. And also the Webpack support team always working to develop this technology so it is easy to communicate with them in case you faced any problem. Okay, in order to use Webpack, we need to download Node.js. Node.js will allow you to start dealing with Webpack. Node.js has two versions. The first version is the latest version of Node.js. And the second one is the recommended version. I don't prefer using the latest version because it is still in the stage of modification and development. I mean, it's still a demo version. And that means you will encounter bugs and problems. So that's why I prefer downloading the recommended version. And downloading it is very easy and there is no problem or any complexity. Okay, the Node.js you must download it. The optional thing is to download an external terminal. I'm comfortable on one of the terminals called HyperTerminal. The terminal will allow you to run the server with ease or to create files or folders fastly. It has many advantages, including that it saves us time. But as we said, it is not mandatory to download it. You can use the terminal inside the code editor. After you successfully installed Node.js, I prepared a startup folder. Go to the startup folder. It will show you what is inside the folder like this, as you can see right now on the screen. Now I want to open this folder on one of the code editors, or in case you install the hyper terminal, press right click and then select open hyper here. First, you have to write the code editor name that you are using. I'm using the Visual Studio Code 
Then I have to write code, then space, and then write a dot, and press enter. Then the project will be opened inside the Visual Studio. The first folder, which is the bundler, the webpack bundler that we are going to use till the end of the course. The second folder, which is the source folder. These are the files that we will write the code on. I have prepared the canvas and also prepared the styles as we did them in the previous lessons. And we also have the JS file. Okay, now we want to install the 3JS. The way we install 3JS while using Webpack differs from the original way, which is by loading a script file. Here I have to install something called 3JS dependencies. So now I have to use the terminal. First, we open the terminal in the same location that I have the Webpack folder or the project folder. We can open the terminal in several ways. The first way is by pressing Ctrl and then press Backtick. The location of the Backtick on the keyboard is usually below the Escape key. The Escape key is located in the upper left of the keyboard. You have to make sure that the path you have here is the same where your folder is located. And if you still can't know how to open the terminal, then you can simply click at the terminal and then select a new terminal. Okay, to understand what dependencies mean, and how we can install them, we want to see together this slide. Imagine that we have a guy called Hanafi. Hanafi is a very popular name in my country, so I will call it Hanafi. Hanafi works as an architect, and his work requires him to keep abreast of development and technologies within his field of work. Hanafi decided to search for the best place that would contain all the resources he might need. And after a long search, he found a library called NPM. NPM is a place that contains books, or we can call them packages, for most disciplines and fields. So Hanafi decided to go to this place. Hanafi is always familiar with certain books that benefit him in his field of work. He consistently studies the same books. But after a while, his acute manager told him to start learning a new technology that would enable him to upload his designs on the web, and told him to start learning 3JS. So while Hanafi was inside the NPM, he asked one of the library employees to bring a new book called 3, and the programmatic formula of this request will be in this form, npm install 3, which means, from the NPM library, I want to install the package which is called 3. Okay, let's apply everything we talked about in practice. First, we want to agree that the book in the example here is called package. I can find the packages inside the project, in the package.json file. .json is a file format such as any file format. In JSON file, the data format is similar to the object in JavaScript. The only difference is that the key is in the form of a string. The packages that I need to run any project are under the dependencies, which is mean that the dependencies are where the packages are located in any project. These packages are already prepared to help us start our project. On the first entry into the project, I need to download all packages. Only on the first entry, we have to install them. So we open the terminal and install them by writing npm install, which means from npm install all packages written inside package.json. So by pressing enter, the packages will start installing. After it has finished downloading, the node modules folder will be shown. This folder contains modules for the packages I requested. Okay, let's back to the packages. Here we can see that we don't have three package. Therefore, I want to download it in the same way that we saw in the example, which is npm install 3. Okay, I have a question. How do you know that the package name is a 3? And we can know the answer from the 3GS documentation. There is a section explaining how to download this library. The first way is as we did previously, by downloading it as a script file. And there is another way, which is, if you want to download 3GS library from the npm, they told you here that the package name is a 3. So we know that the package name is a 3 from the documentation. So press enter, then the package will start downloading. After the download is complete, the package name will appear here in the dependencies. And now, we downloaded the 3GS library successfully. And this package, the 3 package, contains all the classes that I need. Now is the time to run the server. To run the server, we have to write npm 
run dev. Then the server will automatically start. Okay, let me quickly adjust the screen. I close the terminal. Don't worry, the server will still be running, cause I close the terminal, not the server. The terminal is a thing, and the server is another thing. Okay, now as you can see in the CSS file, I gave the body black background color. However, this change does not appear in the body background color, cause in the webpack, the main file is the script.js. So I have to link the CSS inside the JS. Previously, we used to link them from within the HTML file. But here, we have to do that inside the JS. And that's done by writing import and then specifying the location of the CSS file. As we can see, that after any changes in the JS file, the page will auto reloading. So I imported the styles and now I also want to import the 3GS library by writing import and then we use the star and the star means everything as a 3 from 3. Okay, now I want to paste the script that we used from the previous lesson. It contained the same things. We used scene, mesh, camera, renderer, and the clock class. The code contains the same things. So now the server is working without any problems. Okay, that was everything for today, and see you in the next lesson. In today's lesson, we will continue what we started in the animation lesson, and also know several types of movements. The actual goal of today's lesson is to build the rationale, which makes it easier for us to guess the direction of movement, thus saving us time and completing the required animation. This lesson will be divided into two parts. The first part is the mathematics. The second part is the alternative to using math by using an external package called gsap. Okay, go to your resource folder and then open the startup folder by using any code editor. Then the folder will appear like this. Now open the terminal and select new terminal. Since we have not downloaded the packages, meaning that the node modules folder does not appear. Then I have to download the packages by typing npm install. As we said, that npm install will install the packages inside the package.json. We don't have to download the three package, I already put it with the packages. And then we have to run the server by typing npm run dev. Now our server is running. Okay, we have all used mathematics directly or indirectly. For example, if you have an array containing several elements, as here in this array contains these elements, 0, 1, and 2. Now somehow, I want to get this result, which is 0, 2, and 4. Then simply you will multiply each value inside the array by 2. The initial values are the values in the array before the calculation is performed. The final values are the values after the calculation is performed. And what is in between is the logic. Logically, you said that we have to multiply each element in the array by 2. The principle that you extend the programming logic is always related to your experience as a programmer. And the experience is related to the number of problems that you encountered throughout your career. So, that's why in this lesson, we will show you the most popular movement patterns out there and understand why an object moved in that direction. Okay, in our lesson, the initial value is the mesh position before the movement started. Let's take our mesh as an example. Its location is now at the origin point. The final state is the action you want this cube to perform. For example, you want this mesh to start moving one to the right. So the programmatic logic here will be moving the cube by one on the positive x. This type of movement is called static motion, meaning that the mesh goes from one point to another and then stops moving. And the second type of movement is the repetitive motion, continuous movement that does not stop, like what we did with the cube when we rotated it on the y-axis. The repetitive motion 
needs a constantly changing value, and this value is the elapsed time. The elapsed time starts at zero and then increases steadily. And if the value of the elapsed time doesn't increase steadily, then the direction of the movement will be unpredictable. For example, if the elapsed time starts at zero, then it starts increasing to one, then to minus two, then to four, and so on, I will not be able to predict the movement of the mesh that I'm going to animate. Okay, so we will now begin to learn about the most popular movement patterns that we have. We want to start with the first pattern, which is the linear function. Okay, to understand this type of function, let's see this slide. As we said, that the elapsed time is a value increases steadily. To get a linear movement, which is what we will get from using the linear function, the elapsed time must be a power of 1. Meaning that the elapsed time is not multiplied by the elapsed time, and it is the same as the elapsed time raised to the power of 2. Or b under the root, which is the same as the elapsed time raised to the power of 0.5. These examples does not give me the linear function movement. In the linear function, the elapsed time variable must be raised to the power of 1. Here we have the elapsed time variable. To know the movement direction, take multiple values, for example, 4 or 5 values. Now I want to move the mesh on the x-axis and the y-axis. So I want to start by defining the points on the x and y-axis. The location of the first point on the x-axis is equal to elapsed time. The first elapsed time value is zero. So we open a parenthesis and write a zero. And the same thing on the y-axis, which is equal to zero. Then we write another zero. The beginning of the movement will be from zero x and zero y, meaning at the origin point. In the same way, let's locate the second point. The elapsed time value became one. Then the value of the x and y will be equal to one. The third point will be 2 on the x and the y. And the last point will be 3 on the x and the y. After you have specified all the points, it is now the time to set them on the axis. Okay, the left part is the x value and the right part is the y value. The location of the first point is at x0 and y0, meaning that it is in the same location as the origin point. So here is the location of the first point. And the second point is 1 on the x and 1 on the y. So we go to the x1 and draw a line, and then we go to the y1 and draw a line. The intersection of the two lines is the location of the point. And in the same as the second point, we go to the x2 and draw a line, and on the y2. So this is where the third point will be located. And we do the same on the last point. Now I want to draw a line that goes through all the points that I made. What is the best straight line we can draw that goes through all the points? Of course, it will not be like this, and also not like this. We have to start from the first point, which is 0x and 0y, and we end at the last point we set, which is 3x and 3y. So the line will be like this. We will conclude that the mesh will start moving from the origin point and will continue moving in this direction. Okay, let's do that in our project. Okay, so let's do a linear function section. First, we want to move the mesh on the x by a value of the elapsed time, and also we want to move the mesh on the y by a value of the elapsed time. As you can see, that the mesh moved in the same direction that we drew, starting from the origin point, and then keep moving in the same direction we drew. If you want to know the inclination of this line from the x-axis, its value will be 45 degrees. As we said, here the elapsed time variable is raised by a power of 1. If we change the elapsed time variable like this, so the movement pattern will also change. Here the elapsed time variable is raised by a power of 2. Okay, let's take another example. In this example, the change was in the elapsed time value on x. I gave the elapsed time a negative value. Let's start locating the points. The first point is 
negative 0 on the x. Negative 0 or positive will give me the same value. On the y is also a 0. The second point is a negative 1 on the x and 1 on the y. The following point is negative 2 on the x and 2 on the y. And the last point is negative 3 on the x and 3 on the y. Let's start marking the points on the axis. The first point is 0x and 0y. The second point is a negative 1 on the x and 1 on the y. So the point will be here. The following point is negative 2 on the x and 2 on the y. So the point will be here. And the last point is a negative 3 on the x and positive 3 on the y. You don't have to be 100% accurate in locating the points. We only want to know the movement direction. Okay, let's start drawing the line, which is as we said that it starts from the location of the first point and goes through all the points. Then our line will look like this, almost like this. Okay, let's give the elapsed time on the x a negative value. Then our mesh will start moving in this direction. Let's reduce the speed of movement on both axes. Here we only reduced the elapsed time, then the movement speed will also be reduced. Okay, so I will conclude that if the elapsed time was negative, the mesh will start moving in the negative direction of that axis. We gave the mesh position on the x a value is equal to negative elapsed time, then the x position of the mesh will move on the negative x axis. Let's try to give the mesh a negative value also on the y axis, then the mesh will start moving on the negative x and negative y. Okay, if we change the value to positive on the x axis and negative on the y axis, then the mesh will start moving like this. Okay, let's take another example. What will happen when we add a value to the elapsed time? Here I added a 1 on the elapsed time in the mesh x position. Let's see what the direction of movement will be. The first point, elapsed time 0 plus 1 will be equal to 1, and 0 on the y. The second point is, is when the elapsed time value is equal to 1, so 1 plus 1 is equal to 2, and on the y, the value will be 1. The third point is a 3 on the x and 2 on the y, and the last point is 4 on the x and a 3 on the y. Now let's locate the points on the axis. The first point is 1x and 0y, so here will be the location for the first point. The second point is 2x and 1y, so the point will be here. The next point is a 3 on the x and 2 on the y, and the last point is 4 on the x and 3 on the y. Now we want to draw a line that goes through all of these four points. Then the line will be like this. I conclude that if I added a certain value to any axis, in this case, the axis is the x-axis. Then the beginning of the movement of the cube on the x-axis will be from the added value, and then it will gradually increase. I added one on the elapsed time value of the mesh x position, then the movement of the mesh on the x-axis will start at x1. If I added 2 to the elapsed time value, then the movement of the mesh on the x-axis will start at x2, and so on. Let's return the value of the elapsed time on the y-axis to the positive, and now we want to add 1 to the elapsed time of the mesh x position. Notice where the mesh movement started on the x-axis. It started from 1 on the x. If I remove it, then the mesh will start moving from 0x. Let's see again, if I added 1, the mesh starts from x1 and then increases gradually. And the same thing on the y. If I added 1, then the mesh will start moving from 1x and 1y. From here, where I'm pointing with my mouse cursor. Okay, let's see one last example. When I subtract from the elapsed time, let's locate the points. The first point on the x is 1 minus 0, so the value will be 1 on the x, and the value on the y will be 0. 
the second point is on the x, 1 minus 1 is equal to 0. So 0 on the x. And the y value will be 1. The third point is negative 1 on the x and 2 on the y. And the last point is negative 2 on the x and 3 on the y. Now we want to locate the points on the axis. The first point will be here. The second point is 0x and 1y, then the point will be here. The next point is a negative 1 on the x and 2 on the y, then the point will be here. And the last point is negative 2 on the x and 3 on the y, then the point will be here. Now we want to draw a straight line that goes through each of these points. Then the movement direction will be like this. So I will conclude that if I subtracted a certain value from the elapsed time on any axis, in this example, I subtracted the value from the x-axis, then the beginning of the movement will be at the subtracted value of that axis, and then it will start decreasing. The subtracted value here is 1, and it is subtracted on the x-axis. Then the movement of the mesh on the x-axis will start from 1, and then it gradually decreases. Okay, let's do that on our project. First, we need to change the plus to minus. As you can see, the, the mesh position on the x will start from 1 and then it gradually decreases. If I change the value to 2 on the x, the mesh position on the x will start from 2 and then it gradually decreases. Okay, this was the first type of functions which is the linear function. My goal in our experiment with the linear function is to know how to locate the points on the axis, and thus know the direction of the mesh movement. Okay, I put in the resource folder the most used functions that will do a specific movement pattern. We don't want to waste your time trying them out, so try them out after the class. Okay, now we want to explain the trigonometric functions, such as the sine, cosine, and tan. Let's start with the first function, which is the sine function. This is how the sine function will look like. As you can see, that we passed the elapsed time inside the sine parentheses. The axis that we have here is the elapsed time instead of the x-axis, and the value instead of the y-axis. The mesh movement will start at zero when the elapsed time value is zero. When the elapsed time value starts to increase, the value is also increased. The value will keep increasing until it became equal to 1. The value will be equal to 1 when the elapsed time value is equal to half of pi, or when the elapsed time value equals to 1.57 seconds. Let's remember what we explained in the last lesson, which is that the pi equals 3.14. So pi divided by 2 equals 1.57 seconds. So the mesh will reach to the highest value, which is 1, when the elapsed time value equals 1.57 seconds. Okay, while continuing to increase the value of the elapsed time, the value will start decreasing until the value is 0, and the value of the elapsed time will be pi, which is the same as a 3.14 second. So when the elapsed time equals 3.14 second, the value will be 0. Now we want to add another half a pi, so the value will be a negative 1, and the 1.5 pi equals 4.712 second. And that means that when the elapsed time value equals 4.712 second, the value will be at its lowest, which is minus 1. And when the elapsed time equals 2 pi, the value will be 0. The 2 pi value is 6.28. This is the full cycle of sine. As you can see, the value is restricted between two values, which are positive 1 and the negative 1. The value will start at the 0 and then will keep increasing until it reaches the maximum value at 1. And that will happen when the elapsed time equals 1.57 seconds. And then the value will start decreasing until it reaches the pi. And then 1.5 pi. And the last step the value will reach is when the elapsed time equals 2 pi or 6.28 second. And as the value of the elapsed time increases, this cycle will be repeated again. This is the 0 and this is the 2 pi.
every 2 pi will give me a full cycle, and that means that the value will start from 0 and goes to 1, to 0, to negative 1, to 0. This full cycle equals 2 pi. And as we said in the rotation, that the mesh will rotate around itself each 2 pi, or each 6.28 second. And the same as the sine, which will give me a full cycle each 2 pi, or 6.28 second. And every half a pi, the mesh will enter a new phase. And that means that in the first half of pi, the mesh will reach to the maximum value, which is 1. Another half of pi, the mesh will reach 0. Another half of pi, the mesh will reach negative 1. And another half of pi, the mesh will reach 0. Okay, let's see the sine function in action. Let's now try the sine function. So we write here math.sine elapsed time. But let me comment out this part. As you can see, that the cube goes from 0 to 1 to 0 to negative 1 to 0. Let's see the value of the elapsed time for each stage the cube reaches. So we want to print the elapsed time inside the console. Let's see what the elapsed time value will be when the cube reaches the maximum value, which is 1. We said that the elapsed time value should be approximately 1.6 second. I got a 1.7 because I'm not very precise. Let's see now when the cube completes a full cycle, which is as we said that the elapsed time value should be 2 pi, and it is approximately at 6.3 seconds, and here we almost have the 2 pi value. Let's see now the elapsed time value when the cube reaches to negative 1 on the x-axis. And as we said, that the elapsed time value should be approximately 4.7 second. As we got here, 4.7 seconds equals a negative 1. Okay, as we said, that this is how the sine function will look like. And it will make the value goes from 1 to minus 1. Okay, what do I do if I want the value to go from 2 to negative 2? Simply by multiplying by 2. And if I want the mesh to go from negative 3 to positive 3, then I should multiply the elapsed time by 3, and so on. And that's all what we have to know about the sine function. The second function is the cosine function, and it is the same principle as the sine function, but the value starts from 1 to 0, to negative 1 to 0, to 1. That means that the value will start from 1 and give me a full cycle till it back to 1. Okay, let's try that, and change the sine to cosine. As you can see, that the cube starts from 1, and then it starts to do a full cycle. Here also the full cycle value equals 2 pi. Okay, let's see that. Here the value is equal to 6.38, almost the same value as the 2 pi. We can use the sine and cosine together to do a circular animation. And that will be done by moving the mesh on the x-axis a distance equal sine elapsed time. And moves the mesh on the y-axis a distance equals cosine elapsed time. Now we can see that the mesh starts doing this circular movement. The last function is the tan function, which will give me this movement. Let's try the tan function on the x-axis. Let's try the tan also on the y-axis. Then the cube will start moving like this. Okay, mastering mathematics will save you time in doing any animation, and it will enable you to dispense with some packages that will increase the size of the project, which reduces the performance of the site. So take your time to improve in mathematics, cause you will need it. Okay, now we want to see the alternative 
of using mathematics, which is by using an external package called GSAB. So let's see what GSAB is. GSAB is a JavaScript tool allows you to make animation on the browser. You can animate every element in the browser by using GSAB package. The documentation is straightforward and clear, and each feature has an illustration next to it. Okay, let's see now how we can use the GSAB package. Okay, since GSAB is an external package, so we have to download it from the npm, and the package name is GSAB. So we open the terminal, our server is running, so we have to close the server by pressing Ctrl and press C twice. Open the package.json file to make sure that we are downloading the package we want. And now we write npm install gsap. Now the package will start downloading. And when the download finishes, we can see the package name right here. Since we didn't specify the package version, then the latest version will be installed. Currently, the version I'm working on is a 3.10.4. Okay, let's run the server again. Now to use the gsap package, we have to import it, just like we have imported the 3 package. So we have to write, import gsap from gsap. Now I want to print the gsap variable inside the console, to see if I get access to what is inside it. Let me remove some of the codes inside the animate function. Okay. These are the methods that I got from the gsap variable. Today, we will only use the to method. So we go anywhere, but it must be after we create the mesh that I want to animate. First, we write gsap, and we said that we are going to use the to method. The to method accepts two arguments. The first one is the element that I want to animate, which is in this case, the mesh. And then we specify what we are going to do. If I want to move the mesh, then we have to write position. And if you want to rotate the mesh, then we have to write rotation. I want to move the mesh, then I will write position. The second argument is going to be an object, and then I have to specify the duration, which is the movement duration in seconds. And the second thing is the delay, also in seconds. And the delay is how long the element will wait before starting the animation. And the last thing is, on any axis you want the mesh to move, and how much the distance that you want the mesh to move. Now if I refresh the page, the mesh will move like this. The first thing will happen is a 1 second delay, then the mesh moved to x1 within 1 second. Okay, let's now do another animation. In the same way, we write gsap dot to mesh dot position, I want the duration to be 2 seconds. Now. Since I want to move the same mesh, the delay value must start from the sum of the previous delay and the previous duration. The previous delay value is 1, and the previous duration value is also 1, and their sum is 2. So the delay value for the second animation must start from 2, so that we don't have any overlap or intersection in the animations. And now, I want to specify the axis and the value that I want this mesh to move. I will make the mesh go to the negative one on the x-axis. Let's see now what will happen. First, the mesh goes to one, and then to negative one. If I decreased the delay value, then an animation overlap will happen, and thus will give me an unpredictable animation. And the last thing we have to know, that in each gsap line, there will be a request animation frame. That was all for today, and see you in the next lesson. In today's lesson, we will talk about one of the methods in the object 3D, which is the lookat method. Okay, before we get into the lesson, let's see what the startup folder consists of. I made six meshes and gave each one of them a different color. If you want to move an object on the three axes, as I did in the white mesh, I moved it in the X and the Y and the Z. So instead of writing the mesh position in three separate lines, you can use the set method and then you specify the object location. The first field is the position of the mesh on the x-axis. 
and the second one is for the y axis and the third one is for the z axis and then I added the meshes inside the scene. I created the camera and also the renderer and I created the animate function. Okay, as we said that the lookat method is one of the methods in the object 3D. The object 3D is a class that contains the properties and methods and every element inherits from this class will get an access to what is inside this class. Now we want to search for the lookat method. The lookat method is very simple. You can know what it will do from its name, lookat. Just like when someone told you to look at something, then you will rotate your head in the X and Y and Z until you can see the thing. Okay, as you can see, the lookat method accepts one parameter, which is vector3. And here they are telling us that this method will rotate the object to face a specific point in the 3D space. Okay, let's see now how we can use it. First, I need to specify the object that I want to rotate. Let's take the yellow mesh as an example. And then I will use the lookat method. And here they are telling us that this method accepts a vector 3. And the vector 3 here is for the object position expressed in three values the x, y, and z. Okay, now I want the yellow mesh to look at the white mesh. So we have to write white mesh dot position. So the yellow mesh rotated like this. The yellow mesh will look at to the white mesh center. Cause as we said, that the look at method will make the object rotate until the object is facing a specific point in the 3D space. And the point in this example is the white mesh center. Okay, as we know that the position is expressed in vector 3. So if we back to the object 3D and search for the position property, we can see that the position is expressed in vector 3. And to make sure that the position is expressed in vector 3, if we wrote white mesh dot position, we will get a vector 3 in the console. And this vector 3 have a value on the x, and on the y, and on the z. Okay, let's try the lookat method again. We want the purple mesh to look at the pink mesh. In the same way, we copy this line. Here we write purple mesh. And here we write pink mesh. Then the purple mesh rotated like this, and start looking at the pink mesh. Okay. Now we want the pink mesh to look at the green mesh. So we write here pink mesh. And here we write green mesh. Then the pink mesh rotated like this. And so on. That's how we can use the look at method. Okay, one of the things that you can do with the look at method is to make the mesh rotate depend on the mouse position on the screen and the mesh can be anything. It can be a cat head or a human eye or anything you want and when you start moving the mouse the mesh will keep looking at the mouse cursor position. So now we want to do the same by making one of the meshes rotate depending on the mouse position. And to do that, we first need to know the mouse position on the screen. And that will be done by using a mouse event listener. So let's do a mouse listener section. And then we create the event listener by writing window.add event listener. And the event that we are going to use is the mouse move. This is the event responsible for tracking the movement of the mouse on the screen. And then I will do an anonymous function and write event inside of it. You don't have to write event, you can write anything, but I will follow what most developers will write, which is either E or event. And the event will return a lot of things. I'm only interested in the values of moving the mouse in both axes, the X axis and the Y axis. We can reach the mouse position on the X and the Y by writing event.declientX and event.declientY. And inside the console, we can see the current mouse position on the X and on the Y. The mouse position will be calculated starting from this place, from the top left. 
in the top left, the mouse position will be zero on both axes. And when I move to the right, the X value will increase. And when I move down, the Y value will increase. Okay, now I want to make the mesh to look at my mouse position in each frame, depending on the values that I got from the event listener. So I'm going to use these values inside the animate function. But I have a problem, which is that the event listener will do something called scope to everything inside of it. And that will not allow me to use these values outside the event listener. And to solve this problem, we have to save the values we got from the event listener in the global scope. And that will give access to these values from any local scope. So we go outside the event listener and then write constant cursor is equal to and then I will do an object. And inside this object, I will write x and give it a value equals to 0 and y equals 0. And that means that when I didn't move my mouse, I want the x and y values to be 0. And inside the event listener, when I start moving the mouse on the x and the y, I want to know the mouse coordinate at that moment. And then update the cursor object. And that will be done by writing cursor.x and equals it to the mouse position on the x which is event.declientx. And the same thing on the y. We write cursor.y is equal to event.declienty. Now let's see the cursor object values inside the console. As you can see, that when I move the mouse, the cursor object will be updated depending on the mouse position. Okay. Now when I move my mouse on the x-axis, we can notice that the maximum value we got is approximately 780. But when I increase the screen size, like this, now when I want to see what is the maximum value I will get from moving my mouse on the x-axis, we notice that it became approximately 1500. Then I will conclude that the values on the x and the y will change based on the dimensions of the screen that displays the project. And thus, the rotation value will change from one device to another. But we want to get the same rotation value on all screen sizes. And that will be done by linking the object rotation on the x-axis to the screen width. And link the object rotation on the y-axis to the screen height. And we already know that we can get the screen width and the screen height from the window.inner width and window.inner height. So now, I will print the window.inner width beside the event.client x. And beside the event.client y, I will print the window.inner height. Okay, now when I increase the screen size and then move my mouse to the bottom right, which is where I can get the maximum value of the mouse position on the x and the y, we notice that the mouse position on the X is almost equal to the screen width. And the mouse position on the Y is almost equal to the screen height. So depending on that, we can get the same values of the mouse position on the X and the Y, regardless of the screen size. And thus, will give me the same rotation value on all devices. And thus will be done by dividing the mouse X position on the window.inner width and dividing the mouse Y position on the window.inner height. And this will make the values range from 0 to 1. Okay, let's divide the client x on the window.inner width and also divide the client y on the window.inner height. Now inside the console, we want to print only the cursor.x and cursor.y. Let's see what the values will be when I increase the screen size. Now when my mouse position is on the left edge of the screen, the cursor value on the x will be 0. And when I start moving my mouse to the right, the maximum value I will get is 1. Now let's see that when I decrease the screen size. Now when my mouse position is on the left edge of the screen, the cursor value on the X will be 0. And when I start moving my mouse to the right, the maximum value I will get is 1. And that's how we can get the same value regardless of the screen size. And this is called normalize, which is mean that a value goes at the range that I already know. In this case, I normalized the mouse position so that it will go from 0 to 1. Okay, now we want to make the mesh to start rotating depend on the mouse position. And here we can use the lookat method. By the way, 
we can use the lookat method inside the event listener, but I want to use it inside the animate function, and that will make the rotation smooth and better. Okay, first we want to create a lookat section, and as we said that we should specify the object that we want to rotate, I will choose the green mesh. So we write green mesh, and then I will use the lookat method. Now we want to write the vector 3 inside the parentheses. So we write a new 3 dot vector 3. This line will allow the green mesh to look at something and I can describe that something position in three values, which are the X and Y and Z. In the X field, I will write cursor.x, which is the mouse position on the X axis. And in the Y field, I will write cursor.y which is the mouse position on the y-axis. And since the mouse will move in only two axes, then I will write one in the z field. Now as you can see, that the cube starts to rotate. Okay, now when I move the mouse on the x-axis, the cube rotation is almost acceptable. But on the y-axis, when I move my mouse down, the cube will lock up. And when I move my mouse up, the cube will lock down because the client y value will decrease when I move up and increase when I move down. And we can solve this problem by putting a minus before the cursor.y and that's how we can reflect the values and thus the direction will also be reflected. Now we fixed the cube rotation direction on the y-axis. But if you noticed that we also have another problem which is that the cube does not rotate when my mouse is on the negative axis. As you can see, here the cube doesn't look at my mouse cursor, but when I start moving on the other side, or on the positive x axis, the cube will look at the mouse cursor. So, when my mouse is moving in the negative area of the x and y, the cube rotation will not be correctly. And the reason for that is that when my mouse enters the negative area of the x and y, the cube will not be able to rotate to that side, because the rotation values are always positive. And to make the cube start rotating at this side, the rotation value should be negative. The values range currently between 0 and 1, so the cube won't be able to rotate when the mouse cursor is on the other side of the cube. And to solve this problem, we have to subtract 0.5 from the cursor.x and the cursor.y. Currently, the values in the cursor.x and the cursor.y are going from 0 to 1. And if we subtract 0.5, the values will go from minus 0.5 to 0.5. And thus will make the mesh rotates on both sides. So we subtract 0.5 from the cursor.x. And we also subtract 0.5 from the cursor.y. Okay, now let's see how the cube rotation will be. Excellent, everything works fine. And when we reach the part where we are going to explain how to import a 3D model, you can apply what you have learned from this lesson to the model. That was everything for today, and see you in the next lesson. In today's lesson, we are going to make our canvas responsive. And responsive means that the canvas responds to the size of the screen that will display the project, just like the media query in the CSS. Currently, if I increase the screen size, the canvas won't be responsive. So we want to solve this problem. By the way, our canvas is responsive now, but I have to reload the page after I change the display screen size. So all we have to do is to do an auto resizing to the canvas when the display screen got changed. And that will be done by using the event listener. The event that I'm going to use is the resize event. So first, we need to do a resizing section and then write window.addEventListener resize and then we write the anonymous function and what I'm going to write inside the anonymous function will be executed when your display screen size got changed we want to print resize inside the console so we write console.log resize now every time our display screen size got changed the resize word will be printed in the console ok now I know when the resize happen. So now we want to know what should we do when the resize happens. First, I want to change the canvas size depending on the new screen width and height. 
In one of the previous lessons, we said that the part responsible for determining the canvas dimensions is the aspect variable. The aspect variable is responsible for two things. The first thing is for determining the aspect ratio of the camera, and the second thing is for determining the canvas dimensions. So we want to change the values inside the aspect variable every time a resize is happening. Now we can access what is inside the aspect variable by writing aspect.width and equal it to the new screen width. And we do the same to the height. And equal it to the new screen height. And again, these two lines means, mean that when a resize is happening, I want the canvas to cover the entire screen width and height. Currently, we don't have any changes because the canvas dimensions depend on more than one factor. So let's change the second factor, which is the camera aspect ratio. I will do a new section and name it a new aspect ratio. And then we write camera and then we choose the aspect property. Then we write aspect.width divided by aspect.height. And that means when a resize is happening, I want to change the camera aspect ratio because, as you know, the image captured by the camera has dimensions. And as the screen size changes, we also need to change the size of the captured image. Okay, every time I change one of the camera's properties, I have to update something called projection matrix. We don't want to go into detail about what the projection matrix is, but all we have to know is when the camera captures the image, there will be some work to be done by the 3GS in the background. So when we change one of the camera's properties, we also have to change the camera's projection matrix. And that will be done by writing camera dot update projection matrix. Now, let's see if we have any changes. As you can see, that the mesh will shrink when we increase the screen width and will stretch when we decrease the screen width. And the same thing will happen when we change the display screen height. Okay, now we have to fix or change the third factor, which is the renderer size. Every time a resize happened, I want the drawn image on the canvas to match the new screen size. And that will be done by creating a new section and naming it a new renderer size. And then we write renderer.setSize, aspect.width, and aspect.height. Now let's try to change the screen size. Everything works fine. And also in mobile sizes, the canvas will be responsive. Okay, let's summarize our lesson. Any 3GS project dimensions will depend on three factors. The first thing is the width and the height of the canvas. The second factor is the camera aspect ratio. And don't forget to update the camera projection matrix. And the last factor is the dimensions of the drawn image. Okay, now before we end our lesson, I want to talk about the pixel ratio. Let's see this slide to understand what pixel ratio is. Any screen, whether it is mobile, TV, or smartwatch screen, if we take a magnifying glass and look at this screen, we will see that this screen consists of squares. Each square is called a pixel. In the past, when companies started manufacturing devices, you could see the pixel with your eye, and each pixel will render a specific color. And at that time, the pixel ratio value was 1. Okay. But what do we mean by the pixel ratio? The pixel ratio is the ratio between a number of pixels in a device to the logical pixel. And the logical pixel is the number of pixels without any division, without being separated into pixels. Let's understand more. In the past, pixel dimensions were known to all companies. And all the companies were making the pixel with the same dimensions. Thus, the pixel ratio value was 1. But now, companies started dividing pixels into several pixels, and that will increase the image resolution. So instead of coloring the pixel with the same color, the pixel will be divided into several pixels, and each pixel will be colored with a different color. Thus, the image will be more clearly. The pixel ratio value in these devices 
will be higher than 1. Ok, let's now explain how the pixel will be divided. First, when the pixel ratio value is 1, the pixel dimension will be the same as the standard pixel, and the pixel will be colored with the one color. The GPU will color and then render only one pixel. And if the pixel ratio value is 2, the pixel will be divided like this. And now, we have 4 pixels. Thus, the GPU will have to render 4 pixels. And if the pixel ratio value is a 3, then the pixel will be divided like this. And thus will give us 9 pixels. Thus, the GPU will have to render 9 pixels. Ok, so where is the problem with that? The problem is in the phones, which usually have more than 2 pixel ratio, because the size of the phone's screens is small. So companies are forced to divide the pixels in order to increase the screen resolution. But the problem is the weakness of the graphic cards in the phones. So it's so hard for the phone GPU to color this amount of pixels. Therefore, we need to unify the pixel ratio value on all devices that display the project. So let's see how we can do that. To solve this problem, we have to write renderer .set pixel ratio math.min window.device.pixelRatio and 2 and that means from the renderer I want to set the pixel ratio and here I used the math.min to choose the lowest number between these two numbers which are 2 and the current device pixel ratio this line will give me the pixel ratio for the device running the project so if we print this line in the console as you can see, that my device pixel ratio equals 1.25. So the device pixel ratio will be 1.25 because the 1.25 is less than 2. If I was using a device that has a pixel ratio more than 2, then the pixel ratio will be 2. And so on. This was everything for today and see you in the next lesson. In today's lesson, we are going to talk about cameras. Till now, we only used one camera, which is the perspective camera. In this lesson, we will see the other types of cameras and where we should use them. So first, we have to go to the documentation and search for camera. Then we will get 7 results. We have 5 types of cameras. And the cameras here are the result of our search for the camera. The first type of camera is the array camera, the cube camera, orthographic camera, perspective camera, and the stereo camera. And here we have the camera. This camera is an abstract class. And here they are telling us that in order for the object to be a camera, it should inherit from this class. And thus, the children will get access to the properties and the methods inside the camera class. These are the properties and these are the methods. So if we clicked on the perspective camera, we notice that this type of camera inherits from the camera class. So we can call it a camera and also inherits from the object 3D. Okay, we will talk about all types of cameras, but we will focus on only two types, which are the orthographic camera and the perspective camera. Okay, let's start with the first type, which is the array camera. The array camera will allow you to render the scene from more than one camera. Let's see this example to understand more. If you are playing a multiplayer game, like a car racing game, every player needs to have a view of their car. Every player needs a camera that will view their car. And this camera should track the movement of the car, and the screen that displays this game must be divided by the same number of players. And here is the same thing. The scene will be divided into several parts, and on each part, there will be a camera, and each camera will render the image that it captured. In this example, the scene is divided into 36 parts, and on each part, there will be a camera. Usually, this type of camera used in VR scenes. Okay, let's see the second type of cameras, which is the cube camera. The cube camera will create a six cameras. And this will allow you to do six renders from all the sides. 
A camera that captures the scene from the front, a camera that captures the scene from the back, and from the top, bottom, and on the left, and on the right. Meaning that you will take pictures of everything around you, like the 360 images. Also, we won't use this type of camera. The third type of cameras is the stereo camera. The stereo camera will use two perspective cameras, and these two cameras have an effect called 3D in a glyph. This effect is the result of merging two colors, red and cyan, and this effect will make image like this. This effect is similar as if you were wearing a 3D glasses, so everything you see around you will be a mixture of two colors, which are red and cyan. Okay, let's see the fourth type of camera, which is the orthographic camera. Here telling us that this type of camera uses something called orthographic projection. And the orthographic projection will make the dimensions of the object in the image constant regardless of the object distance from the camera, meaning that this camera does not have perspective. Thus, you won't be able to know if the object is close to the camera or far away from the camera. This type of camera is used in the 2D games, such as Mario or GTA 2. The orthographic camera was located at the top, and even if you are walking on the street or the rooftop, your size would remain constant. Here we have another example. We notice that we have a lot of boxes. It's supposed to be the boxes in the front to be larger than the boxes in the back, but since the scene is being shot with the orthographic camera, the boxes sizes will be the same. Okay. Let's see another example. Here we have two cubes. And we also have the perspective camera. If we saw what the camera will capture, we will be able to know which of the cubes is the closest and the farthest. But if I change the camera to orthographic camera, it becomes difficult to know which of the cube is in front of the other, because this type of camera does not have perspective. Okay. Now let's try the orthographic camera and know the parameters for this type of camera. The orthographic camera accepts six parameters, which are left, right, bottom, top, near, and far. This camera will look like a cube or a cuboid, and you will determine the dimensions of this camera. The image will be taken in the form of a square or rectangle. Okay, let's try this camera in our project. First, let me comment out the perspective camera and we create the camera by writing constant camera is equal to a new 3 dot orthographic camera. The first field inside the parentheses is for the left distance. I want it to be equal to 1, but since the distance is on the left, we have to write a negative 1. I want the distance on the right to be equal to 1. And on the top, I need the distance to be equal to 1. And the bottom distance, I need the distance to be 1. But since the distance is on the bottom, we have to write a negative 1. Then I have to specify the near and the far values. I want the near to be 0.1, and I want the far to be 1000. Then the cube will look like this. As you can see, that the cube looks as if it is a flat. If we compare this camera with a perspective camera, you can see that the scene will look more realistic. Okay, so that was our lesson for today, and see you in the next lesson. Our lesson for today is about orbit controls, one of the features that will make the site more realistic and better interact with the user is by adding orbit control to your website. The orbit controls will allow the user to control and interact with the models inside the website. As we have here in the GitHub site, they added the orbit control on this model, and thus will allow you to control the model whether by rotating the model or by changing the model position, also you can zoom in and zoom out. And we also have other features that we will see in this lesson. So let's get to know the orbit controls. The orbit controls from its name, orbit, and this means that a particular object revolves around another object, such as the moon revolving around the Earth. Here they are telling us that the orbit controls will allow the camera to rotate around the target.
and this target can be anything. It can be a Vector 3, so the camera will rotate around the position of this Vector 3. And by default, the camera will be rotating around the origin point. Okay, let's add the orbit controls in our project. We can import the orbit controls by writing import, and then I will use the curly bracket. The curly bracket will allow me to extract a specific thing, because we have a lot of controls. But I want to extract the orbit controls. So I will write orbit controls. The orbit controls is located inside three examples JSM controls orbit controls. And that's how we can import the orbit controls. Now I want to make sure that I imported the orbit controls correctly. So I want to print the orbit controls inside the console. Since we do not have any errors, then we have imported the orbit controls correctly. Okay, as you can see, this class needs two things. The first one is the object, and the second thing is the DOM element. Okay, let's return to the documentation to know what is these two things. Here they are telling us that the object is the camera, the camera that you want to control it. As we said, the orbit controls will allow the camera to rotate around the target. So, we want to specify that camera. Okay, and the next thing is the DOM element, which is the canvas. Okay, let's pass these two things to the orbit controls class. But first, we need to create the orbit controls by going anywhere, but it must be after we have created the camera and the canvas, so that we can access to these elements. And first, I will do the orbit controls section, and then write constant orbit controls is equal to a new orbit controls without writing a three, because we used the curly bracket to extract a specific thing. And now, as we saw in the documentation, that we have to pass the camera as we named it, and the canvas. And now, if I click and drag, I will notice that I can control the camera, and thus will allow me to see the scene from different angles. We can rotate the camera to the right, or to the left, and we also can zoom in and zoom out. We also can move the camera by pressing right click and drag. Okay, let's back to what we said before which is that the camera is rotating around the origin point, because I feel like the cube is rotating, not the camera. Okay, to make sure that the camera is rotating, not the cube, we want to move the mesh and see how the rotation direction will be. So we move the mesh by writing mesh.position.x is equal to 3. Now when we start rotating, we can see that the camera does not rotate around the cube we can clearly see that the camera rotating around the origin point. Okay, now let's see the orbit controls properties. Orbit controls have a lot of properties. We will see the most used of them. The first property is the auto rotate. It is a Boolean value, either true or false. If we change the property value to true, the camera will start rotating around the target. But they put a note here that we have to update the orbit controls inside the animation loop. Okay, so we go after the orbit controls and write orbit controls dot auto rotate is equal to true. Now we need to update the orbit controls on each frame. So we go inside the animate function and write orbit controls dot update. Then the camera will start rotating like this. We can control the auto rotate speed by using the auto rotate speed property, but keep in mind that the default value is 2. Okay, now let's change the rotation speed by writing orbit controls dot auto rotate speed is equal to 6. Then the camera will start rotating faster. The third property is the damping factor. 
the damping factor is the same as the coefficient of friction. Okay, let's comment out these two properties to understand what the damping factor property is. If I start rotating and then I stopped all of the sudden, we can notice that the rotation will also stop. The damping factor will allow us to control how quickly the camera stops rotating. And that will be done by changing the enable damping property to true. So we go back to our project and write orbit controls dot enable damping is equal to true. Now if I start rotating and stop suddenly, we notice that the camera does not stop immediately. It took a short time to stop and that time will depend on the damping factor. And to know the value of the damping factor, we have to write console.log orbit controls dot damping factor. We notice that its value is equal to 0.05. Now if I reduce the value of this number, the friction will decrease, and that will make the camera to take a longer time to stop rotating. And if I increase the value of this number, the friction will increase, and that will make the camera to take a less time to stop rotating. Okay, let's now reduce the damping factor value and see what will happen. I will copy this line, and equal it to 0.01. Now if I start rotating the camera, we can see that the camera took a longer time to stop rotating. But if I return the value of the damping factor as it was, we can see that the camera took a shorter time to stop rotating. These were the first three properties. We will see the most used properties gradually with the upcoming lessons. So this was everything for today and see you in the next lesson. In today's lesson, we want to talk about geometries. Until now, we have used one of the geometries we have, which is the box geometry. But before we know the other types of geometries, let us know what is the geometry. Geometry is vertices and the vertices are the sum of the word vertex and the vertex is a point in the 3D space. So if you said vertex or point, they both have the same meaning. So each vertex will get a position in the 3D space, then lines will be drawn between each three points, then a triangle will be created and many triangles form the surface or the final model. Suppose we have four vertices Vertex A, Vertex B, Vertex C, and Vertex D. And then we want to create the first triangle by drawing a line between A and B, B and C, C and A. And let's create another triangle by drawing a line between C and D, D and A, A and C. Thus, one of the geometries that we will talk about later is formed, which is plane geometry. Each vertex from these vertices contains data, contains attributes, and these attributes consist of three main things. Each vertex contains position and UV coordinates and normal coordinates. And also you can add other attributes. As we reach the shader section, we will add other attribute in order to get the shape we want. Okay, let's now see the geometries that we have. I prepared the most geometries you might use, and in order not to waste your time, we will not write them in the code. We will just discover them fastly, just to know that they are existed. And when you need the geometry, you can get back here and see how to use it. Okay, the box geometry. We already know what is the box geometry. As we said before, we have a width, height, and depth. And each one of these arguments will have a segments. We will talk about segments later. The second geometry is the capsule geometry. This geometry got a radius and length. And we also have a circle geometry. This geometry have a radius and segments 
theta start, which is where I want to start the first segment. Theta length describes how you want the circle to look like. The default value is 6.28, which is the same as the 2 pi value, which is mean that we want a full circle. If you start decreasing the value, the numbers of sectors will be reduced. You can do Pac-Man shape in case you want to. Okay, con geometry, have a radius, and height, segments, theta start, and theta length. The next geometry, which is cylinder geometry, we have a radius top, which is the upper radius, and the radius bottom, which is the bottom radius. Also, we have a height, segments, theta start, and theta length. We have a plane geometry. This geometry have a width and height and segments. Sphere geometry and torus geometry. Okay, you can add multiple geometries in order to get a good looking model. But the main reason for these geometries is just for testing. And that means if you want to design more complex designs, then you have to use one of the available software such as Blender or download the 3D model from the web. We have a lot of 3D models for free, and in fact, you will find everything that comes to your mind there, so don't worry. Okay, let's back to the box geometry, and let's now understand what we mean by segments. Until now, we only use three arguments inside the box. The width, and height, and depth. The rest are the width segments, and height segments, and the last one is depth segment. These segments allow you to control the number of drawn triangles on each face of the geometry, and the default value for each one of them is equal to 1, which is mean 1 is the value for the width segment, and 1 is the value for the height segment, and 1 is the value for the depth segment. Okay, we need to draw so we can understand more. We have agreed at the beginning of this course that every 3D model is made up of many triangles, right? Let's now focus on the front face, which has a green frame. In case the segment value is equal to 1, which is the default value as we said before, then a line will be drawn on the front face like this. And now, I have two triangles. In this case, as we said before, that the segment value is equal to 1. If the value of the width segment is equal to 2, the width will be divided into two parts. And in each part, a line will be drawn like this. First one here, and the second one here. So now, I have four triangles. In case we give the cube a width segment is equal to 2, and height segment is equal to 2, as we did before, we divide the width into two parts, and also we divide the height into two parts. And in each part of these four parts, a line will be drawn like this. 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay, how many triangles do we have now? We have 80 triangles. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, what is the benefit of this? In case you have a flat surface like this cube, then you don't need the segments at all. But in case you want to make a sphere, then you need these segments. Simply because every sphere or circle, they are basically curves. And the more straight lines there are, the closer the shape appears as a curve. Let's assume that we have to draw this curve. If I told you to draw this curve by using only three straight lines, you will start drawing the first line like this. And then like this. And the last line will be like this. If I told you to draw the same curve, but this time, using 6 straight lines, you will start the first line like this, the second line like this, 3, 4, 5, 6. As we said before, the more straight lines there are, the closer the shape will appear as a curve. So how do I get more straight line? And the answer is from the segments. Every time I increase the value of the segment, I will have more straight lines. But I told you before that if we increase the value of the segments, we will have more triangles. But how now it became a straight lines? 
because every time I increase the value of the segment, the amount of the vertices also increases. And then I will have more straight lines. And when we have more straight lines, the number of drawn triangles will also increase. Okay, so let's back to the sphere geometry. As you can see that we have width segment and height segment. The width segment value is equal to 32, not 1, like plane, so they can do the curved line. And that's also the same for the height segment. The value is equal to 16. If we decreased the width segment and height segment's values to lowest value, then we will get this shape. Let's make the value back as it was 32 here and 16 here. If you noticed that the sphere is not 100% have a spherical shape, which is mean, if you look closely, you can see the straight line on the edges of the sphere. So how we can solve this issue? Of course, you already know, by increasing the segments. So we go here and start increasing the width segment, and we also increase the height segment. Then the sphere became more spherical. Okay, I hope everything is clear to you, and you understand that very well. Now let's back to our cube and try to change the segment's value. Let's refresh. We got no change, because as we said before, in case we have a flat surface, segments has absolutely no effect. But why does it even exist? It exists in case you want to write your own shader code. Then you will be able to change the shape and the color of these vertices, as we're gonna do later when we reach the shader section. Okay. But how can I see these triangles? By simply going inside the material object and then we write wireframe true. Take a look here, we notice that we can see these triangles. Wireframe property allows you to see these triangles. So as we saw, the segments increase the number of the triangles. Okay, if we get back to the documentation, and then we search for the geometry, we will find buffer geometry. Each geometry from these geometries have a buffer version, which means box geometry have box buffer geometry, circle geometry have circle buffer geometry, cylinder geometry have cylinder buffer geometry. But what is the difference between a normal geometry without buffer word and buffer geometry? Buffer geometry is the same as the normal geometry. Also, this geometry will have vertex, position, normals, UV coordinates. Also, we can add custom attributes. But this type of geometries is lighter on the GPU. But why is it lighter on the GPU? Because buffer geometry has less attributes than the normal geometry. The main attributes like vertex position, UV coordinates, normals, these attributes are found in both type of geometry. And the more advanced attributes that we will not use because we are beginners, there is no need for them to exist. So, buffer geometry has less attributes. So if we use this kind of geometries, the loading on the graphics card will be reduced. So if we go to the geometry, and then we add buffer to the geometry, we can notice that there are no changes. It's the same cube without writing buffer. But the GPU now is so happy. So always try to maintain the mental state of the GPU. Okay, now is the time to do our own buffer geometry. We will create a very simple geometry, which is a triangle. But as we said before, in case you want to do a more complex geometry, then you have to create them using one of the 3D softwares. Or you can just download the model from the website. But be careful, the model must be licensed in order to be able to use it. Okay, first of all, let's comment out our geometry. And now, we want to make a new geometry by writing constant geometry is equal to a new 3 dot buffer geometry. Okay, we have nothing on the screen right now because currently this geometry is empty, which is mean a geometry with no vertices. So now, we will add these vertices. The vertices are added to the geometry by using something called float32 array. The float32 array is one of the arrays types in JavaScript. So it's not something related to 3JS. Here in the documentation, you have some examples about how to use this array. 
float 32 array is a typed array. And typed array means that this kind of array can only store one type of values, and that type is the float. So we can't store inside this array string or boolean, we only can store float values. So we are going to use this array to store the vertices position. Okay, let's now create this array, so we should write constant, and I want to name this array vertices array, is equal to a new float32 array. We said that we want to make a triangle, so we need to have three points, or three vertices, and each vertex has a position on the x, y, and z. So we must give each vertex three values, and since we have three vertices, so 3 multiplied by 3 is equal to 9, so we need to have 9 values in order to create the triangle. So I click inside the float32 array, and then we create an array, I will specify the position of these vertices. I want the first vertex position to be in the origin point, which is 0, 0, and 0. The second vertex I want it to be on the top of the first vertex, which is 0, 1, 0. And I want the third vertex on the right of the first vertex, which is 1, 0, 0. Okay, this is our array. And inside this array, we have values which are 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. This is the x, y, z position for the first vertex. And this is the x, y, z for the second vertex. And then the x, y, z for the third vertex. The second step is to convert these numbers to attribute. And we have to tell the array that every three values represent the position of the vertex. And to do that, we have to write constant positions attribute is equal to a new three dot buffer attribute. And inside the buffer attribute parentheses, we have to write that this array, which has a name of vertices array, I want every three values to be separated. So I pass the array name here. And here I write three. And the last step is to decide what we are going to do with each three values. Because this line has only two functions. The first one is to convert the array values into attribute. And the second one is to separate the values from each other depend on the number we wrote here. In this case, I passed the number 3, so each three values will be separated from other. So now, I will tell them that every three values that got separated is representing the vertex position. So I have to write geometry dot set attribute, open a parentheses and write position, Which is mean from this geometry, I want to create a new attribute, and I choose the position, and then I pass the attribute. And after that, we will notice that a triangle mesh has formed. Okay, now we want to see what the attributes we have inside the geometry, and to see the attributes, we have to write console.log geometry, open the console. Then open the buffer geometry, and then open the attributes. We found here that we have only one attribute, which is the position. And if we click on the position attribute, we will notice that we have array. And inside this array, we have nine values, which are the same values that we specified before. And the item size is the number of values that represent the location of each vertex. So every three values inside the array represent the location for the vertex in order. 1, 2, 3, this is the coordinates for the first vertex. 1, 2, 3, this is the coordinates for the second vertex. And 1, 2, 3, this is the coordinates for the third vertex. And so on. Okay, now we need to see what are the main attributes inside the geometry. So let's comment out this line and then return the plane geometry.
and we also come in this part, we don't need it right now. And we write here, plane buffer geometry. And we give the width and height value equal to 1. Now open the console and click on the plane geometry and then we move to attributes. These are the attributes that we talked about at the beginning of the lesson. The UV and normal coordinates, we will talk about them later in one of the next lessons. Right now, I'm only interested in position attribute. We notice that we have here 12 values. Every three values represent the position of one vertex. So I'm currently have four vertices. Okay. In the latest 3GS update, they merged the buffer geometry with the geometry. As you can see, I have created the geometry and I used the plane buffer geometry. Below the plane, we notice that we have three dots. And these dots will tell us that the buffer geometry is declared here. And that means that the buffer word has been deprecated. So now we can create the geometry without writing buffer, but we still can have the buffer feature. In the upcoming lessons, I will keep using the buffer word, but you don't have to write it with me. And that was everything for today, and see you in the next lesson. In today's lesson, we are going to talk about textures. But what does texture mean? Textures are images that surround a mesh from all sides in order to give it more detail. First of all, we pick a geometry shape. Suppose we choose a sphere geometry. And now, I want to add this texture. As you can see, it's just an image that has a width and a height. Then the final mesh will look like this. And now, you can know what this sphere geometry was, which is a basketball. So as we said, that the texture gives the geometry more detail. Okay. Just as there are types of geometry, there are also types of textures. We will talk about the most used types. Let's start with the first type, which is the color texture. The color texture is the simplest type of the textures. It is an image placed on the geometry, just like the basketball example. The second type, which is the displacement texture. This type is used to move the vertices. So the vertices will change their location depending on the texture color. Which is mean, if we put this texture on our geometry, the vertices at the white part will move up. And the vertices at the black part will move down. And the vertices at the gray part will not move. To see this texture on action, you need more vertices, so we have to increase the segment's value. The third type, which is the normal texture. The normal texture color will be like this, a mixed color between the blue and the purple color. Usually this texture used to add more detail on the geometry, but we need to have lights on the scene, and we don't need a lot of vertices, cause the vertices won't move from its position and you will notice the details of the geometry. And these details are not due to the movement of the vertices, so this texture is better for performance cause we don't need any subdivisions. The fourth type, which is the bump map. This type of texture will reflect light in different proportion. The white part will reflect the light more than the black part. So the geometry will get depth or detail depending on the texture color. Okay, these are the main types of the texture. There are many other types, but since we are a web developer, we won't care about the other types. Now let's see how we can add the texture. As we said that the texture is an image, so we need to know how we can add and load an image on our project. Since we are using a webpack bundler, so we will load the image in a certain way. But in case you are running the project in another bundler, it is possible that you will not able to load the image in our way. Okay, let's try to load the texture. In order to be able to load anything in our project, these files, either images, models, or anything else, must be inside the static folder. So if you take a look at the startup folder, and then move to the static folder, 
you will find a texture folder. Inside this folder, I prepared the textures that we talked about at the beginning of the lesson. We can see the picture by writing inside the URL the path of the image starting from inside of the static folder. For example, if you want to see an image that has a name color.jpg, the path of this image is slash texture slash color.jpg without writing static in the URL. So we move to the URL and write a slash and then we write texture slash and the image name which is color.jpg and this is the image. So you can imagine that this URL like it is the static then you can go to any folder you want. Okay, now we know that we have access to that image but how can we load this image? Any image you want to use as a texture for the geometry you have to tell the 3GS that you want to use this image as a texture and then the 3GS in the background will convert this image into texture. This process is done by using texture loader class. The texture loader will allow you to convert any image into a texture. It will not convert the image itself, the image will remain the same, but the image will be processed through the 3GS to be treated as a texture. So let's instantiate the texture loader. Constant texture is equal to a new 3 dot texture loader. That's how we prepare our texture loader. Dot load, and now we used the load method. So we can load the image. And inside the load method, we specify the image location from after the static folder. So to load the image, we have to write slash texture slash color.jpg. To make sure that we loaded the image correctly, we go here and write console.log texture. Since I didn't get any errors inside the console, this is how I made sure that I loaded the image correctly. Okay. Now to use the texture on the plane mesh, all I have to do is to remove the material color, I don't need the color anymore, and write map, and the texture name as I call it, which is texture. So the plane mesh looked like this. Now in case you want to load multiple textures like this, we don't have to write texture loader in every line by keep writing the same thing. So to reduce the written code, we need to write the texture loader in a separate variable. And then we create another variable. Constant color texture is equal to texture loader dot load and inside the parentheses we specify the path and then we equal the map property with the texture name if you want to load another texture all you have to do is to copy this line and it change the variable to a new name and specify the new path so you only need one texture loader to load many textures. Okay, loading anything such as loading textures as we did here or loading a 3D model or voice, this will take a time to be loaded. Here when we loaded this texture, it loaded instantly because we're currently working on a local server. But when you upload your project on the web, it will take longer time to prepare the files to be viewed. So you need to do certain styles so that the customer does not feel bored while waiting for the site to be loaded. And for this reason, the 3GS team did a special class to solve this issue, which is by using the loading manager class, so that we can control the display of anything we want of the project before it is ready. Okay, let's add the loading manager. First, I want to create a loading manager section and then write constant loading manager is equal to a new 3 dot loading manager the loading manager will listen to four events on error on load 
on a progress on start. So let's start with the first event, which is the on start. Loading manager dot on start. I will use the arrow function, and I will just print the start word. When we are loading the file, we have to use on load. And when the file is on a progress, and when we have an error, now we need to put the loading manager inside the texture loader, meaning any texture we want to load it, it must go through these four stages. Now when I refresh the page, we can see that three things have been printed in the console. Start, Progress, and Loading. If I didn't write my texture path correctly, then I will have an error, Progress, Loading. So instead of writing console.log as we just did, you can make specific styles that appear to the user at each stage the texture passes before it is completely loaded. Okay, now we have to ask ourselves a question, which is, is the texture placed on the geometry randomly, or is there a certain way to put it? And to answer this question, we have to see this slide. Any texture will get stretched and shrink at some part until it covers the geometry completely, and the stretching and the shrinking of the texture depends on something called UV unwrapping. As we said in the geometry lesson, that each vertex got attributes, such as position attribute, which is responsible for the vertex position in the 3D space. And the second attribute that we are going to talk about now is the UV. UV, which is a coordinate on the X and the Y, and it is used to specify how the texture will look like on the geometry. As we said, that we can express the position of the vertex in three values. So the red vertex position is minus 0.5x and positive 0.5y and 0z. This is how we can know the position of the vertex. And to know the value of the UV coordinate, we have to put the texture on the x and y axis and the highest value for the x is 1 and the highest value for the y is also 1. And then all the vertices are replaced on this texture. We have four vertices, so we will put four vertices on the texture. And now, each vertex has a position in the 3D space, the so-called position. And also each vertex has a position on the texture, and this position is called UV. So the first vertex location according to the position attribute is minus 0.5x, positive 0.5y and 0z and the location for this vertex according to the uv attribute is 0x and 1y the second vertex location according to the position attribute is 0.5x 0.5y and 0z and the location for this vertex according to the uv attribute is 1x and 1y the third vertex location according to the position attribute is minus 0.5x, minus 0.5y, and 0z. And the location for this vertex according to the UV coordinate is 0x and 0y. And the fourth vertex location according to the position attribute is 0.5x, minus 0.5y, and 0z. And the location for this vertex according to the UV attribute is 1x and 0y. And the last step is that this texture is divided on these vertices evenly. Since we have four vertices, this texture will be divided into four quadrants. So each vertex is responsible for displaying a part of this texture. The first vertex will display this part, and the second vertex will display this part, the third vertex will display this part, and the last vertex will display this part. And after finish the texturing, the geometry will look like this. This is the final form that is displayed. Okay, let's see the UV coordinates and its location on the geometry. 
As we said before, that the attributes are located inside the geometry. So first, we want to console.log geometry and then we move to attributes and we click on the UV. We notice here at the count that the number is 4 with the same number of vertices and the item size value is 2 which is mean that each vertex has two values inside the array the x and y value so the first uv value for the first vertex is 0x and 1y meaning the point is here the second uv value for the second vertex is 1x and 1y meaning the point is here the third uv value for the third vertex is 0x and 0y meaning the point is here the fourth uv value for the fourth vertex is 1x and 0y meaning the point is here okay now the lesson is not over but to understand the other types of textures we need to use a certain types of material so we will complete the rest of the texture lesson with the material lesson so that was all for today and see you in the next lesson in today's lesson, we are going to talk about materials. Until now, we only used one type of material, which is the mesh basic material. So let's see the other types of material. But before doing that, let's remember what is the main purpose of using material. So the material is used to give or add features to geometry by coloring every pixel on the geometry. And this process is done by shader code. For example, right now we have this plain geometry the material comes with the help of the fragment shader code and color each visible pixel on this geometry. But what do I mean by visible pixel? The visible pixel, it is everything that is within the range of the view of the camera. So any geometry is within the range of the view of the camera, I'm gonna able to see it. So every pixel in this geometry will be colored. And any geometry is not in the range of a view of the camera will not be colored. And that will increase the performance because this will decrease the load on the GPU. And that means if we have a geometry behind the camera, there is no reason for coloring that geometry because in the end, we won't be able to see that geometry. Okay, let's now know the most important types of the materials. If we move to the documentation and then we wrote here material, it will show all kinds of materials available. We will talk about the most used materials that you're gonna use as a web developer. So let's start with the first material, which is the mesh basic material. The mesh basic material, from the name, is the most simple material. And they put a note here that this material does not interact with the lights. Or we can say that we don't need a light in order to see this type of material. Okay, mesh basic material contains the properties and methods. Let's now see the properties that we are going to use. The first property, which is the map property. And they are telling us here that this property is used for texturing. And as we saw in one of the previous lessons, that we use this property in order to put a texture on the geometry. In other meaning, we use map property to color each visible pixel on the geometry with the same color on the texture. So let us review what we studied previously and add texture to the geometry. We move here and start doing the texture section. As we said before, that we need a way to make the 3GS convert the image into texture. And that will be done by using texture loader. So we write here, constant texture loader is equal to a new 3 dot texture loader. Now we want to save the texture into a variable, then we have to write constant color texture is equal to texture loader dot load then we load the texture by specifying the texture location the last step is to go to the material and use the map property and equal it to the color texture so finally we have the mesh with a texture on it we can add the properties to the material in several ways the first way is by passing the property inside the material object as we used to do before. The second way is by using the dot notation. 
material and dot as if I want to enter inside an object. It will show me all the properties of this material. And here is the map. I select it, then equal it to the color texture variable. And this will give me the same result. So you can use the way you want. Okay. Also, we have another property, which is the wireframe. It will show you the geometry triangles. The default value for this property is false. So when I change it to true, then we can see these triangles. And if we increase the value of the segments, we will have more triangles. The third property, which is the color property. This property inherits from the color class. Any color is expressed by three values, R, G, B. R from red, G from green, and B from blue. And here we have examples of how we can express a color in 3JS. In the first case, when you have the color as a hexadecimal value, or when you have the color as an RGB value, or in the case we used to do, which is that we write the color as a string, and the 3JS in the background will convert this string into RGB value. So to change the geometry color, then we have to write material, then we can access the color property, and we have to choose the color by writing a new 3.color. And inside the parentheses, we write the color in any form of those here. So if we want to use the hex value, the mesh will look like this. And if we want to use the RGB value, the mesh will look like this. Let's change the color by increasing the green value, then I will get the yellow color. Or if you want to use the color as a string, then the mesh will look like this. Okay, the next property is the opacity, and we can use it by writing material dot opacity, and after that, I have to specify the opacity value from 0 to 1. So that if the value is 0, then the mesh will not appear. And if the value is 1, then the mesh will be shown clearly. So if we wrote 0.4, as you can see, I didn't get any change. Because if we want to use the opacity property, we have to make the transparency property true. So before the opacity, we have to write material.transparent is equal to true. So the mesh appeared like this. To make sure, that this is an opacity, not a color change, we want to add another mesh behind our plane mesh. And we move it back by changing the z-axis value. And now we can clearly see what's behind the plane mesh. Okay. Let's remove the mesh and see the next property. But a quick note, the mesh became darker because the background color is black, so the mesh appeared like it became darker. Okay, the next property is something special for the plane geometry. If we look at the plane from behind, we will notice that the plane disappears completely. The plane actually didn't disappear, but always in the plane, the front face by default is only displayed. And on one of the material properties, we can change that by writing Material dot side. This is the property name which is responsible for deciding what face should be rendered. Is equal to three dot front side. The front side is the default value. If I want to change the rendering side from the front to back, then I change the front to back. And now, if I want to see the mesh, then I have to look at the back side. And if I want to render the two sides the front side and the back side, then I have to write double. And now I can see the mesh from the front side and also from the back. The next property, which is the visible property. By default, it will be equal to true. So if I change it to false by writing material dot visible is equal to false, the plane will disappear. These are the most used properties in the mesh basic material. 
the next material, which is the mesh depth material. The mesh depth material principle is very simple. First of all, the entire geometry will be painted gray, and then the closer the part is to the camera, the more white the part will be. And the farther the part is from the camera, the more black this part will be. Let's change the geometry to torus geometry and give the geometry a new arguments. And let's see the principle of this type of material. First of all, we notice that the color of the geometry is gray. And the closer a part of the geometry gets to the camera, the more white this part becomes. And the farther away, it becomes black. Okay. The next material, which is the mesh normal material. The mesh normal will color the geometry depending on the outside surface of the geometry. So let's use the mesh normal on the geometry. The material will color the geometry with certain colors based on the outward orientation of the geometry surface. The outside surface of the geometry is currently toward me. And even if I zoomed in or zoomed out, the colors will not change because there was no change in the external direction of the geometry surface. But when I start to rotate the mesh, we can see that we have a more pinkish color on the front face of the geometry, because the outside surface of the geometry became in this direction. The GPU is not that smart to know where the outside surface of the geometry, and that's why 3GS team added an attribute to know the outside surface of the geometry. And the attribute name is normal. So if we printed the geometry in the console, and then we moved to attributes, we notice that we have a normal attribute. And that's the attribute that is responsible for the outside surface of the geometry. Here we have an array, and each three values represent the outward direction of the vertex. And this is how the GPU knows the outward direction of all vertices. Okay. But what do we benefit from that? The normal vectors is used when you have a light in your scene, as we will see later when we start studying lights. So in this example, we have a white light located here and the direction of the lighting in this direction. Then the outside of the geometry is lighter than the surface on the other side. This side is white because it is facing the light and the other side will be darker, because it is in the opposite direction of the light. Which is mean that the normal vector will make the scene more realistic. The next material, which is the mesh matcap material. The mesh matcap material will display the appropriate color based on the normal vectors. If we get back to the project, and we take a look at matcap texture, as you can see, it's just a normal image. The idea with this type of material is that it takes the colors on the texture and then distributes the color based on the normal vectors. So the colors that I have in this texture is a brown at the bottom and then the lighter shade of a brown and then the lighter shade of a brown and then the lighter shade of a brown. And these colors are distributed according to the normal vector for the location of the camera. Okay. Let's see how we are going to use this texture. First of all, since we are going to use a new texture, then we have to load it. Constant matcap texture is equal to texture loader dot load. Then we specify the texture location. And we have to change the material to mesh matcap material. And add the matcap texture to the material by writing material dot matcap is equal to matcap texture. At first sight, you will notice no changes. But when I start to rotate the camera, some colors, like the white color here, will keep moving depending on the camera rotation. And this will give us the feeling as we have lighting in the scene. But actually, we don't have any lights. So one of the advantages of this type of material, when we use this type of texture, we can have certain behavior like lighting behavior. Because as we said before, this type of material takes the colors on the texture and then distributes these colors on the material depend on the normal vectors. Okay, 
Now we will see other types of material that it need lighting to appear in the scene. But since we didn't study lights yet, I already prepared two lights so we can use them in our project. Cause as I said before, without these lights, we are not able to see the mesh. Let's add these lights after the scene section. And let's start with the mesh Lambert material. The mesh Lambert material is the simplest material that responds to the light. So let's try it in our project. We have to comment out the matcap, and then we write here, Mesh Lambert material. As you can see, we can see the effect of lighting on the mesh. The surface facing the light will be brighter than the face on the other side. Because I put the light in this direction. And when I remove the lights, the mesh will disappear. The mesh Lambert material makes your scene more realistic due to its interaction with other objects. The next material, which is the mesh Fong material. This type of material is similar to mesh Lambert material. So if we try it here by writing mesh Fong material, you will see no changes. But this type of material is better for performance and will make your scene more realistic because it have a lot of properties. And one of these properties is the shininess. And it is the controller of the surface brightness. The default value for this property is 30. So if we try to manipulate this property value by writing material.shininess is equal to 200, you will feel as if the surface has become shiny. And the higher the value of the shininess, the greater the luminosity. The next property, which is the specular, it is the color of the reflection of light on the surface. And the expression of the color of this reflection is by the color class. So I have to write the color as a new 3 dot color. Let's change the specular property by writing material dot specular is equal to a new 3 dot color. And then we have to specify the color. Now when we start rotating the mesh, we notice that the color of the reflection of the light on the mesh has become green. Okay. The next material, which is the mesh tone material. This material contains tone shading, which will make the mesh cartoonish. Let's comment these lines, and then we write here tone. This type of material does not have any color gradation. The part that is facing the light will be bright or white, and the part that is not facing the light will be gray. And that means that this type of material is not realistic. The color gradation that was happening with the previous types of material does not happen here. The part that the light reaches will be the same color as the light. And the part that the light does not reach will be a shade darker than the color of the light. Okay, the last type of material, which is the mesh standard material. This type of material is similar to mesh Fong material and mesh Lambert material in terms of its response to light. But its interaction with light is more realistic because it contains something called PBR. PBR is stands for Physically Based Rendering, which is that the material behaves more realistically in terms of its response to light. As if we put the mesh in the environment of our real world, being affected by light and shadow formation will be almost similar to our real world. Also, this type of material have more properties, so let's try this material. We change the material to mesh standard material. So as we said before, that this type of material is similar to Fong material and mesh Lambert material. But now we are going to see and use the properties of this material, such as metalness and the roughness. The metalness is how you want your material to act and look like metals. Non-metallic which is the elements that have a metalness value equals to zero, like stones and woods. And the metallic elements are the elements that have a metalness value above the zero, like silver and gold. Okay, that's about metalness. As for the roughness, it's how much rough the surface is. If its value is zero, the surface will be smooth. And if its value is one, the surface will be rough. And the one is the default value. So let's try the roughness and the metalness. 
we move here and we reach the metalness property by writing material.metalness is equal to 0.35 and in the same way we can access the roughness property and I'm going to make the roughness value 1 which is the default now when I start to decrease the roughness value we can see that the surface roughness also decreases so that the mesh begins to reflect light more clearly we can see that the surface roughness also decreased and each time I decrease the roughness value the mesh will become more smooth as for metalness the more it is valued the darker the mesh becomes so according to the features you want to add to the mesh try to find the appropriate value between the metalness and the roughness ok we have finished most of the material types but there are 5 types left we will talk about them when we get to their lesson for example, we use the points material in order to have some particles. The shader material and the raw shader material, we will talk about them in the shader section. Okay, and now we want to continue talking about the textures we mentioned in the previous lesson, which are the bump texture and the displacement texture. Because we can use this kind of texture with a specific type of material, such as mesh standard material. So if we moved to mesh standard material, we can see that we can add bump texture and displacement texture on this type of material. So let's begin with the bump texture. We can add a bump texture by using the bump map property and then we write the texture name. So let's try it on our mesh. First, we go to the texture section and then write constant bump texture is equal to texture loader dot load and our texture is located in slash texture slash bump dot jpg now we want to return the geometry to plane geometry and add the first texture on the plane by using the map property as you can see, the first layer of texture is just a normal image. And as we said in the previous lesson, that the bump texture reflects the light in varying proportions depending on the vertex color. If the vertex color was white, which is mean, when the vertex was located on the white area of the texture, then the light will be reflected more. But the effect of the reflection of light on the mesh is in the form of depth or detail. So when we add the bump map, we notice that it gave the mesh bumps, and these bumps are the result of light reflection. The white part on the texture will do these bumps, and the black part will not do that. Okay, that was the bump texture. And now, let's see the displacement texture. So let's add this texture to our mesh. Constant displacement texture. And then we specify the texture location. The texture name, displacement map. And now, we have to use the displacement property by writing material the displacement map is equal to displacement texture but why I didn't get any changes because I only have a few vertices so to increase the number of vertices then I have to increase the width segments and the height segments after adding this texture then our mesh will look like this as we can see here we notice that this part is whiter than others so the vertices on this side have moved a greater distance and the vertices located on the white part also moved and the vertices located on the black part didn't move at all okay so this is all that you have to know about the bump and displacement map the last thing before we end the lesson we want to talk about the environment map the environment map are images that surround the scene from all sides. Also, 
we can use the environment map on the material to reflect these images. So to use the environment map, we need to use the cube texture loader. We have a lot of loaders and each one of them has its use. We used the texture loader and now we will use the cube texture loader. The cube texture loader asks you to give them six images. Image for the positive X, P from positive, and then from negative. So we need an image for the positive X, which will appear on the right of the scene. And image for the negative X, which will appear on the left of the scene. And image for the positive Y, which will appear on the top of the scene. And image for the negative Y, which will appear on the bottom of the scene. And image for the positive Z, which will appear on the behind of the scene. And image for the negative Z, which will appear on the front of the scene. I prepare these images inside the M folder. Six photos from all sides, similar to the 360 images. Now let's instantiate the cube texture loader. I want to instantiate it after the texture loader by firstly making a cube texture loader section and then write constant cube texture loader is equal to a new 3 dot cube texture loader. And now I want to load these images just like what we did in the texture loader. So we write constant env texture is equal to a cube texture loader dot load. Then we open a parenthesis and inside this parenthesis we create an array. And inside this array we locate the images. The first image, which is according to the documentation, should display the positive x, which has a name px.png. The second image should display the negative x, which has a name nx.png. The third image should display the positive y, which has a name py. The fourth image should display the negative y, which has a name ny. The fifth image should display the positive z, which has a name pz. The sixth image should display the negative z, which has a name nz. Then I have to make scene dot background is equal to env texture. So I changed the background of the scene and it became six images, which are the images that I added inside the cube texture loader. Also, I can add the environment map on the mesh, so it will look as if the scene is reflected on the mesh. I want to make my mesh a sphere and give it a radius equal to 0.5 and increase the value of the segments to 32 on the width and on the height. And remove the texture and return the metalness and the roughness. And the last step is to write material.envmap and equal that to the texture name which is envtexture. Then the mesh will appear like this. Let me decrease the roughness value so I can see more clearly. Because as we said, that if we reduce the value of the roughness, the roughness of the geometry surface will decrease, then the surface of the mesh will appear as if it were a reflection of the scene. And again, I repeat that this is not a reflection of the scene, this is just six images. Because if I comment this part, I will not have any changes on the mesh. That was everything for today, and see you in the next lesson. In today's lesson, we are going to talk about how we can debug the UI, and why we need to use a debug. The debug will save us time to know the exact value of anything in the UI, in case you want to coordinate the color of the mesh with the background. So every time you want to change the mesh color, then you have to go inside the color object and start choosing the color you want until you choose a color. And in case you don't know some of the color's name, and in case you want to move the mesh a certain distance but don't know how much, then you will have to keep trying a values until you find the distance you want. So that's why we want to have a debug UI, to save us time instead of guessing the correct value or the value that we want. The debug UI is the same as the table in the documentation. You specify the properties that you want to debug it, such as the width, 
and the height and the depth. We have a lot of debugging panels and of course you can create your own debugging panel. But today we are going to use the dat.gui. As usual, since we are going to add external package, we have to install the package from the npm. And the package name is dat.gui. So we open the terminal and shut down the server and then write npm install dash dash save dot dot gui now after the package installed we have to run the server then we have to import the package by writing import star as that from that dot gui now i want to make sure that we have imported the package correctly and that will be done by printing the main variable that I got from the package, which is that. Since we have something printed inside the console, and that something is not error, then I will know that I have imported the package correctly. Now I want to create the GUI so that I can add the controls panel inside of it. So first, I want to create a debugging section and then we create the dat.gui by writing constant gui is equal to a new dat.gui. Then the panel will appear here. Now I want to add inside of it the things that I want to tweak. But we have several types that I can add inside the gui. So let's start with the first type, which is the range. The range in case I want to move from one value to another with a certain range. So first, I want to create a range section and then write gui.add. The add method will allow me to add things inside the panel. Then we specify the object. And then we specify the transmission type. For example, if I want to move the object, then we have to write position. And in the second parameter, we specify the axis that I want to move the object on it. And I want to move the object on the x-axis. Then we write x as a string. Now as we said that the range type will allow the mesh to move within a certain range. And that range is between the minimum value and the maximum value. So first, I want to specify the minimum value and make it equal to minus 3. And also specify the maximum value and make it equal to positive 3. Now as you can see that we can move the cube at a certain range which is between minus 3 and positive 3. And the step value here will change by a value of 1 by default. If I want to be more precise in moving the cube then I have to change the step value so we write dot step and inside it we specify the step value. And now the step value is 0.1. Okay, if I have more than one mesh, then I have to give each control a specific name so that I can know which mesh I'm moving. And that will be done by using the name method. So we write here dot name and inside it, we give the control the name that we want. Then the name will appear here. And now I can know that this control will allow me to move the first mesh on the X axis. Okay. This is all about controlling an element in a certain range. And the second type is in case I want to control a boolean value, which means that the value is either true or false. For example, if the value is true, I want to activate the wireframe on the mesh. And when the value is false, I want to deactivate the wireframe. So first, I want to create a boolean value section, and then we write gui.add, now since the wireframe is a property inside the material, so first, I have to write material. And in the second parameter, we write wireframe. Then a checkbox will appear here. When the box is checked, the value will be true. And when I uncheck the box, the value will be false. Okay, a quick review. I was able to add the wireframe in the GUI as a boolean panel because the wireframe is expressed as a boolean value. 
But for example, we can't add the opacity as a Boolean panel because the opacity is expressed as a float value. So we have to use the range control. Okay, the third type is in the case I want to give the mesh a specific color, which is by using the dot add color method instead of using the dot add method. But we have a problem, which is that we don't have direct access to the color property. For example, if I write console.log material.color, we notice that we reach the color class. But in case I printed the mesh position on the x-axis, then inside the console, I will directly have the location of the mesh on the x-axis. And to solve this problem, first, I have to create a color object, and I want to name the object material color. And inside this object, I want to create a color property, and give it a value of the white color. Now, since I have created an object, then I can access what is inside this object by using the dot notation. Okay. First, I want to create a color section and then write GUI.addColor. Then we write the object name. And then the property name, which is color. Then the color will appear inside the GUI panel. But as you can see, that the material color does not change when I change the color from here. So I want to connect or link the color change from the panel to the material color. So I want the material to listen to the change that happens inside the GUI color panel. And that will be done by using the onChange method. So we write here dot onChange and inside the onChange, I want to create an anonymous function. And that means that in case I have changed the color from the GUI panel, I want to do the following. And I want to change the material color. So we write material.color and then we have to use the set method. And this method will update the color once the color got changed from the color panel. And inside the set method, we specify the color which is the same that is inside the material color object. So we write material color dot color. And now I can change the material color from the color panel and you can choose the color that you want. So these are the most used types that we can add inside the GUI panel, such as in case you want to move an object at a certain range or adding a Boolean value or change a color. And this was everything for today and see you in the next lesson. In today's lesson, we are going to talk about the lights. The principle of how the lights are working in 3JS is similar to the principle of its operation in our world. But as we learned in the material lesson, that to see the light effect, we need to use a specific type of material, such as the mesh standard material and the mesh Lambert material. The lights are used to give the scene more realistic by simulating the light bouncing that light does, and that will form a shadow on some parts of the mesh. Okay, we have several types of lights, we will try all of them and see what is the difference between them. So let's see what lights we have. We go to the documentation and we search for light. Then we will notice that we have helpers and lights. The helpers will help us to know the location of the light and also help us to know the result of the values of the parameters. So we will explain the light and if we have a helper to that light, we will explain it too. And just like any element we studied, that usually we will have an abstract class. And the child element will inherit from this class. Here in the lights, the class name is light. All the lights will inherit from this class. Thus, the lights will get access to the properties and methods inside this class. The properties and methods inside this class are clear and straightforward. For example, here they are telling us that if we didn't give the light a color, the light color by default will be white. Also, we have the isLight property to check if the element is light or not. If the return value was true, then the element is light. And if the return value was false, the element isn't light. Here we also have only three methods. You can read them quickly and understand what they will do.
Okay, let's back to the lights and start with the first type, which is the ambient light. The ambient light will light all the objects inside the scene. Thus, we can't use this type of light if we want to have any shadows, and also does not have a specific direction. Because as we said, this type of light will light all the objects inside the scene. Okay, let's understand what I mean by that. Assume that this X mark is the ambient light. Let's start with the first thing I said about this light, which is that it does not have a specific direction. So this will not be the light direction. It will also not be similar to the behavior of natural light. And the natural behavior of light is the emission of light will be in the form of an angle. Assume that we have a cube in the scene with ambient light. Every part of this cube will be illuminated in all directions with the same color as the ambient light. And this confirms the second information about this light, which is that the shadows will not be formed on the meshes, because logically, we have illuminated every part of this cube. The light has no helper because it has no direction or specific location. And the presence of this type of light in the scene is only to simulate a certain behavior of light, which is to illuminate all elements in all directions. We can add the ambient light by writing a new 3.ambientLight, and then we can add it inside the scene, just like any element. The ambient light accepts two things. The first thing is the light color, and the second thing is the light intensity. In case we didn't specify the light color, the light color by default will be white. And in case we didn't specify the light intensity, the light intensity by default will be 1, which is the maximum intensity value. And the lowest intensity value is 0. This means that the intensity value range from 0 to 1. Okay, let's add the ambient light in our project. First, we have to change the material type to mesh standard material. And then I want to add the lights after the GUI section. We create the ambient light by writing constant ambient light is equal to a new 3 dot ambient light. Now inside the parentheses, I will give the light a white color and intensity equals 1. And now I want to add it inside the scene. Then the mesh will be lit from all sides with the same light color. And of course you can manipulate the light intensity. But when the light intensity equals zero, then the mesh will disappear. Because the zero is the lowest intensity value. And the highest intensity value is one. And any value higher than one will not do any change. Okay, now we want to add the intensity inside the GUI. Thus, we can tweak the intensity value more easier and also practice how to use the dot GUI. But first, go to the package.json to make sure that we have the dot dot GUI package and also check if you have imported the package correctly. Okay, now we can add anything to the GUI by writing GUI dot add. First, we need to specify the element which is the ambient light. And then we need to write the property name that we want to tweak, so we write intensity as a string. Then we specify what the minimum value is, and the maximum value. And also I want to specify the step value. And the last thing I want to do is to specify the name. Now I can easily tweak the light intensity. Okay, this was the ambient light. Some of the lights have a prop version, and this version is an alternative way of adding lights to a 3D scene. We want to use the prop version, we will stick to the normal way of adding lights. Okay, the second type of light is the directional light. This type of light is similar to the sunlight. First, you have to specify the light position, and if you didn't specify the light location, then the light will be in the center of the scene. The direction of light will be straight lines. The light direction 
will start from the location that you specified and the direction of the light will be towards the center of the scene. If I move the light here, the light direction will be like this. The light will only illuminate the parts it reaches. We create the directional light by writing constant directional light is equal to a new 3 dot directional light. This light will accept the same things as the ambient light, which are the light color and the intensity. And then we add it inside the scene. As we said, if we didn't specify the light location, its location will be in the center of the scene. But let's change the light location by writing directional light dot position dot set and I want to put the light above the mesh as you can see that the light illuminates only the upper part of the mesh okay now I want to add three things to the GUI which are the directional light intensity the light position on the x-axis and on the y-axis so we can see the light effect when I change its position I want to copy this line of code and it changed the light name to directional light and the name to intensity 2 and now I want to add the position so we write GUI.add then we specify the light which is the directional light and the transformation type which is the position and on any axis I want to move the light then we specify the minimum value and the maximum value then the step value and give it a name. Now I want to copy this line of code and change the axis from X to Y and also change the name. Now, when the intensity is increased, the illuminated area of the mesh will increase and the illuminated part will differ depending on the light position. Okay, now we want to add the directional light helper. So we go to anywhere, but it must be after we have created the directional light. And then we write constant directional light helper is equal to a 3 dot directional light helper. And inside the parentheses, we pass the directional light name as we name it. And the last thing is to add the helper inside the scene. This line indicates the direction of light. And when I change the light position, the helper will also change. But as you can see, when I change the light position, the light indicator line does not point to the right light direction. In this case, the line should point to the center of the scene. And that happens because the light helper does not update the light indicator line. But when I change the light position from here, the light indicator line will point to the right direction. Okay, let's see the third light, which is the hemisphere light. The hemisphere light consists of two lights. One on the top, and the other on the bottom. Then all the objects will be illuminated from the top and bottom. Okay, let's create the hemisphere light by writing constant hemisphere light is equal to a new 3 dot hemisphere light. Now inside the parentheses, we can pass three things. The first thing is the top light color, and the bottom light color, and the last thing is the light intensity. Okay, I want to give the top light a blue color, and the bottom light a yellow color. And we want to make the intensity equal to 1. Then we add the light inside the scene. Let's remove the other light's intensities to see more clearly. As you can see, the top part is lit up in blue, and the bottom part is lit up in yellow. 
and the color of the area between the top and the bottom will be a mix of these two colors. Okay, let's add the hemisphere light helper by writing constant hemisphere light helper is equal to a new 3 dot hemisphere light helper. We can pass the light name and then we add the helper inside the scene. The helper will show you the location of the hemisphere light and the top part will be colored with the same top light color and the bottom part will be colored with the same bottom light color. Okay, the next light is the point light. In the point light, the light will be emitted in all directions. Therefore, the light spread will be like this. The point light accepts four things. The light color, the intensity, distance, and it is the maximum distance that light can travel. The default value of the distance is that the light will reach every element inside the scene. But when I give a value to the distance, the light will reach all the meshes within the light range. And the last thing is the decay, which is the amount the light dims along the distance of the light. And that means that the strength of lighting will be at the maximum at the location of the light and then it begins to gradually weaken until it disappears completely. Okay, we create the point light by writing constant point light is equal to a new 3 dot point light. Then we specify the light color and the intensity value and we also specify the distance value. Then we add it inside the scene. Let's comment out the directional light helper. And also I want to comment out the hemisphere light helper. And in the GUI, we want to add the point light position on the X and Y and Z. So I want to copy these two lines and paste them here. And I will repeat one of these lines. We write point light instead of directional light. Here I want to tweak the light position on the Z axis and I want to name it Z point. And also change the name in these two lines. Let's remove the intensity from the hemisphere light and also remove the intensity from these two lights. Now by default, the point light location will be in the center of the scene and you can change the light location until you get the result that you want. Okay, let's add the point light helper. So we write constant point light helper is equal to a new a three dot point light helper. And inside the parentheses, we write the light name as we name it. Then we add it inside the scene. The point light helper will look like this. The next light is the rect area light. The rect area light will give lighting in the form of a square or rectangle, just like the device that is in Photoshoot Studios or the light coming from your window in the morning. And your window has a width and a height. Okay, let's create the rect area light. But before that, let me comment some of the codes Constant rect area light is equal to a new 3 dot rect area light. The rect area light accepts four things. The first thing is the light color, then the intensity color, the lighting width, and the lighting height. So first, we specify the color, then the intensity, then the light width, and then the light height. But let's turn the light back. and it changed the geometry to plane geometry so we can see the light more clearly.
and also I want to turn the camera back. And the last thing to do is to add the light inside the scene. Then the light will look like this. If I increase the light width, then the lighting width will also increase, and the same thing will happen with the height. And of course, we can add the width and the height in the GUI. So I will copy these two lines. And then it change the light name. And also change the properties name to width and height. I want to make the minimum value zero. And I will increase the maximum value. And just change the name to width and height. Now I can easily control the light dimensions. Okay, the next light is the spotlight. The spotlight is similar to the flashlight. The light direction is in the form of an angle. The spotlight accepts six things. The light color, the light intensity, the light distance, the closer the mesh is to the light source, the more intense the illumination on the mesh. And the farther the mesh is from the light source, the light illumination on the mesh will be decreased. The fourth thing is the angle which is the magnitude of this angle. The fifth thing I will explain while creating the light. And the last thing is the decay. And it is the same decay that we explained in the point light. And it is the rate at which light decays with respect to distance. Okay, first I want to comment out the rect area light and here I want to create the spotlight. So we write constant spotlight is equal to a new 3 dot spotlight. First, I want to give the light a color. And then we specify the intensity. I want the distance value to be 8. And the fourth thing is the angle. We want the angle to be 45 degrees, but we already know that the math.py will give us half a turn, which is the same as 180 degree. So when I divide the math.py at 4, or multiply it by 0.25, then I will get the 45 degrees. The fifth thing is called penumbra. I want to make the penumbra value equal to 0.1. And the last thing we should specify is the decay. We want to make the decay value equal to 1. Okay, now I want to add several things inside the GUI. The first thing is, I want to add the spotlight position on the z-axis. Also, I want to add the angle and the penumbra. So here we write angle, and I want the minimum value to be zero. And of course, we write the property's name as it named in the documentation. And here we write penumbra. We want the minimum value to be zero, and the maximum value 1, and also change the name. And move the light position on the z-axis by a value of 2. And then add the light inside the scene. Let's add the spotlight helper to understand more, and that will be done by writing constant spotlight helper is equal to a new a three dot spotlight helper. And then we pass the spotlight name inside the parentheses and then add it inside the scene. Then the spotlight will look like this.
Okay, let's repeat the spotlight parameters again. We said that the first thing is the light color. So we gave the light a white color. And then we specified the light intensity. Then we gave the light a distance equal to 8. And it is the distance from here to here. Meaning that the line in the middle represents the value of the distance. So the lighting won't reach anything farther than this line. Okay, the next thing is the angle. And what is meant by the angle is the angle between any line of these four lines and the distance line. For example, the angle between this line and the distance line. This is the angle that we specified its value, which is equal to 45 degree. Okay, now I want to change the angle value and make it equal to 80 degree. And the 80 degree is the same as math.pi multiplied by 0.5. Now as you can see that the angle value became 90 degree and the effect of increasing the angle is to increase the illuminated area on the surface. Let's return the angle value as it was. Okay, the fifth thing is the penumbra and it is the amount of distortion that gets on the edges of the lighting. When I remove the penumbra, the lighting won't have any distortion or a blurry effects on the edges. But when I start increasing the penumbra value, the distortion will also increase. And this distortion or a blurry effect will make the scene more realistic. Okay, and the last thing is the decay. And it is the same decay that we explained in the point light. This was all the lights and the helpers that existed in the documentation. And that was everything for today and see you in the next lesson. In today's lesson, we are going to talk about shadows. We all agree that with the shadows, the scene will look more realistic. So in the previous lesson, when we cast the light on the torus mesh, the shadow formed on the other side of the mesh. And this type of shadow is called core shadow. The core shadow is the shadow that appears on the mesh due to the presence of a certain type of light. So this is the first type of shadow. And the second type of shadow is the drop shadow. Assume that we have a light located here and we also have a cube mesh and below the cube mesh we have a plane mesh and when the light in this direction we will be able to guess the location of the shadow on the plane which will be in this place. The drop shadow needs several factors to appear. The first factor is the light type. So to have a drop shadow we need to use specific types of light. The lights that will do this type of shadow are three lights. The point light, the spot light, and the directional light. And the rest types of light will not do any drop shadow. But why there are some lights will do a drop shadow and the other types will not do that. And the reason for that is in order to have a drop shadow, the light must have a specific direction. For example, in the directional light, the light direction will be in straight lines and thus, we can know where the shadow will be formed. But in case we have an ambient light, the light will illuminate all the meshes that are inside the scene from all directions, and that's why we can't have any shadow. So we said that the first factor is the light type, and the second element is to specify the elements that cause the shadow to appear, which depending on this example, are the cube, and the directional light. The third factor is to specify the elements that will receive the shadow, which depending on this example is the plane mesh. So on the plane mesh, a shadow texture will be drawn depending on some calculations that will be done by the 3GS in the background. Some of these calculations are how far the light is from each end of the mesh. The mesh dimensions are also important to know how the shadow will look like. The angles resulting from the light falling on the cube and also other factors that will be automatically handled in the background from the 3GS. So in each scene, the shape of the shadow will be different based on the factors that were present in the scene. And the final image, the shadow image, that will be drawn on the plane is called a shadow map. 
So the shadow map is the same as the shadow texture that will be drawn on the plane mesh. Okay, so as we said that in order to have a drop shadow, first, I need a specific type of light. Second, the elements that are the reason for forming the shadow. Three, the elements that the shadow will be drawn on. And the last thing is to activate the shadow from the renderer. So I have to tell the renderer to start rendering the shadows inside the scene. So let's see how we can do that. Okay, in the startup folder, I added two lights. The ambient light and the directional light. Then I move the directional light on the y-axis a distance equal to 2. Here's the location of the directional light. And then I added two meshes, box mesh and the plane mesh. They are located in such a way that the cube is above the plane and the cube is above the plane by a distance of 0.7. I move the camera on the z-axis a distance equal to 3 and on the y a distance equal to 1. Okay, and now we want to follow the steps that we talked about which will lead to forming the shadow. As we said that the first factor is the light type. We have to use specific types of lights in order to have a shadow. And the type of lights that will make a drop shadow are the spotlight and the point light and the directional light. Here we are using one of these lights, which is the directional light. Okay, the next factor or the next condition is to specify the elements that were the reason for forming the shadow. And they are two elements. The first element is the directional light. And the second element is the cube. So below the directional light, we write directional light dot cast shadow is equal to true. And we write the same below the cube. Box mesh dot cast shadow is equal to true. Okay. The third condition is to specify the elements that we want to draw the shadow on, which is the plane mesh. So below the plane mesh, we write plane mesh dot receive shadow is equal to true. And the last condition is to tell the renderer to start rendering the shadow map. So below the renderer, we write renderer dot shadow map dot enabled is equal to true. Then the shadow will look like this. And this shadow will move depending on the box mesh position. So if we move to the animate function and then start moving the box mesh on the x-axis, a distance equal to math.sign elapse time. As you can see, that the shadow map location will change depending on the box mesh position. Okay, now we want to talk about how can we improve the shape of the shadow. And the first step will be by modifying the shadow map size. Because as we said, that the shadow map is an image. And an image will have a width and a height. So if I increase the shadow map size, then the image resolution will increase. And the shadow map dimensions are located inside the light, which was the reason for forming this shadow. And the light is the directional light. So first, I want to create optimized shadow map size section, and we can reach the shadow map dimensions by writing directional light dot shadow dot map size dot width. So now I reach the shadow map width. The shadow map width will be by default equal to 512. So to improve the shadow map width, we have to write a value higher than 512. But the value should be divisible by 2. So the renderer can handle these changes in the background. I want to write 1024. And I want to repeat this line to improve the shadow map height. This was how the shadow map looked like before I changed the shadow map size. And this is how the shadow map looked like after I changed the shadow map size. As you can see, the shadow has become clearly. And every time I increase the shadow map size, the shadow will be more clearly. You should not write a value higher than 1024, because that will affect the project performance. So I want to turn the value back to 1024. Okay, so this was the first step to optimize the shadow map. The next step is to change the shadow map type. So if we go to the documentation and search for WebGL, keep scrolling down until you reach the shadow map property. 
we notice that we have four types. The default type is the PCF shadow map. Okay, click on the renderer constants. Here they simply explain to us the difference between each of these four types. Each type will follow a different algorithm to render the shadow map. Okay, we want to change the geometry to torus not geometry, and thus we should specify the radius of the torus, and also change the tube radius. Then we want to start rotating the mesh on the x-axis by a value equal to elapsed time. And also change the camera position on the z-axis to 2. Now the first shadow map type is the basic shadow type. Here they are telling us that in this type, there will be no filters added to the shadow map. This is the fastest type, but the shadow map quality will be low. So let's change the shadow map quality by going below the renderer and write renderer dot shadow map dot type is equal to three dot basic shadow map. As you can see, that the shadow is simply a pixels, and the shadow map is not realistic, because as we said, that they didn't add any filters to this type of shadow map, and the filters could be a blur effect, which will make the shadow map more realistic. Okay, the second type is the PCF shadow map, and PCF stands for Percentage Closer Filtering, and this algorithm is the default. I want to copy it and paste it here. As you can see, that is better and the quality higher than the basic shadow map. The third type is the PCF Soft Shadow Map. This type uses the same previous algorithm, which is the PCF algorithm. But the only difference is that this type will make the shadow edges softer. And the last type, which is the VSM Shadow Map. This type is using the VSM algorithm. This type will make the elements that receive the shadow also cast the shadow, meaning that it's completely a miss. So if you try to try this type of shadow map, the result will surprise you. So don't use it. Always use either the PCF shadow map or the PCF soft shadow map. That was everything for today, and see you in the next lesson. In today's lesson, we are going to talk about particles and particles are very small parts of matter and exist in abundance. The particle system will allow us to do several scenes, such as a scene of rainfall or snowfall, I can make a hurricane or a smoke. Okay, let's understand what the particles are. Assume that we have this plane geometry. As you can see, it is a plane consists of four vertices. If we want to convert this plane to particles, then we will go to each vertex of this plane and draw a square here and here and here and also here and these four squares always facing the camera. Even if I rotate the plane, these squares will always be facing the camera. Okay, let's now convert the plane geometry to particles. To convert a mesh to particles, we need to use a specific type of material. And we talked about this type of material in the materials lesson, which is the points material. And this type of material is used with a class called points. Meaning that we are going to use the points class instead of the mesh class. The points class is similar to the mesh class. This class will accept geometry and the material. But as we said, the material should be a points material. So let's move to our mesh material and replace it with the points material. And also replace the mesh to points. Then the plane will look like this. As we explained, a square will be drawn at each vertex. And when we start rotating, we notice that these squares will keep facing the camera. The points material also has properties. One of these properties is the size property, and it is responsible for these squares dimensions. And the default value is one. We can change the size property value by writing material dot size is equal to 0.2. Then the squares size will be reduced. 
If we want to make these squares to be closest to each other, then we go to the plane geometry and change the plane dimensions. Then the squares moved closer to each other. I did this to show you the difference between the dimensions we write inside the geometry and the particle size. Okay, now we want to create one of the examples done by the particles, which is the snowfall. Okay, let's see how we can do the snow effect. The idea behind that is to do random vertices, for example, a vertex here and here and also here, until I have a sufficient number of vertices. And as we saw, that in each vertex, a square will be drawn at that vertex. And we can do several things to these squares. We can color these squares, and we also can add texture to these squares. And the last thing is to animate these squares. So let's see how we can do all of these steps. Okay, the first thing I want to do is to create an empty geometry by changing the geometry type to buffer geometry. And then we have to decide the number of vertices that we want. For example, if I want to have 1000 vertices, then I have to write constant vertices amount is equal to 1000. And we already know that each vertex of these 1000 vertices has a position on the X and the Y and the Z. And we want to save this vertices position by using a float32 array. And that will be done by writing constant position array is equal to a new float32 array. And inside this array, I want to limit the number of slots to three times the number of vertices. Why three times the number of vertices? Because each vertex should have three values representing its position in the 3D space, which are the X, Y, and Z. So we write vertices amount multiply by three. So here I created an array that has 3000 slot. And now I want to fill this array with the random values by using the for loop. So we write for let i is equal to zero, then we specify the number of times that I want to loop. And it should be equal to slots in the array, which are 3000 slot. And on every iteration, I want to fill the array by a random value. So we write position array, and then we specify the array index and equal it to the math.random. The math.random will give me a random value between 0 to less than 1. So for example, in the first index, which is when the i value equals 0, I get a random value equal to 0.6. And when the i value equals 2, I get a random value equals to 0.2. And when the i value equals 3, I get a random value equal to 0.9. Now, I need to find a way to tell the geometry that these three values represent the position of the first vertex, and the next three random values represent the position of the second vertex. And that will be done by writing geometry dot set attribute position a new three dot buffer attribute position array and the three. And that means in this geometry, I want to set a new attribute. And the attribute name is position, which is responsible for specifying the vertex position. I want you to take each three values inside this array and make them as a position for the vertex. I wrote something wrong, which is in the iteration number inside the for loop. The iteration number should be equal to the vertices amount multiplied by three so that we can iterate with the same slots inside the array. As you can see that the particles looked like a cube. Let's reduce the particle size to see more clearly and change it to 0.02. Okay, now we want to do the same thing as we did in the lookat lesson, which is by making the values range with the same amount in positive and negative. And this will be done by subtracting 0.5 from the math.random. Because as you can see, that the particles do not rotate around the origin point. And to solve this problem, I have to make the values range by the same amount in positive and negative. So all what we have to do is to subtract 0.5 from the math.random. And that will make the values range from negative 0.5 to positive 0.5. And now the particles are rotating around the origin point. 
Okay, but why we did that? We fixed the rotation of the particles, cause the next step is to animate these particles. Okay, I have two ways to animate the particles. The first way is by moving the camera on the z-axis, and then we start animating the particles. And the second way is by increasing the distance between the particles. Currently, the particle's position is ranging from minus 0.5 to positive 0.5. If I want the values to range from negative 2 to positive 2, then I have to multiply the math dot random by 4. So now the particles have a greater range for their spread on the x, y, and z. Okay, well now we can change the color of the particles from the color property. So the particles will be colored with the same color I specified in the color property. Also, we can add texture to these particles. We want to add this texture to the particles. And of course, you can add the texture that you want, but you need to take care of the texture size. Usually, the texture size should be below 40 kilobyte, so that we don't have any lack of performance. Okay, we can add texture to the particles with the same way we used to add texture to the mesh. So first, I have to create the texture loader And then I have to load the texture by writing constant particle texture is equal to texture loader dot load. Then we specify the texture location. Now we can add the texture by using the map property. Remove the color property and write map and equal it to the texture name. Then the texture will be added to all the particles. Okay, now if I want to take a closer look at any particle, for example, I want to take a look at this particle, we notice that at a certain distance, the particle will disappear. And we talked about the reason for this in the third lesson, and it is because of the near value. Here in the camera, I didn't specify the near and the far values, so the near value by default will be equal to 0.1, and therefore, any particle getting less than 0.1 away from the camera, I won't be able to see it. So I'm going to make the near value equal to 0.01. And also I want to make the far value equal to 100. And now, I can see the particles more clearly. Okay, we notice that on each particle, the entire texture has been added. And that means that the image on the texture is added, and also the black part on the texture is added to the particles. But I only want to add the image inside the texture to the particles and ignore the black part inside the texture. And also, I don't want the black part inside the texture to appear on the particle. So, I want to show everything colored in white and hide everything colored in black. And this will be done by using the alpha map property. The alpha map property will show everything colored in white inside the texture and hide everything colored in black inside the texture. So we want to remove the map property and use the alpha map property by writing material dot alpha map is equal to particle texture. As you can see that nothing has changed because the alpha map is treated like the opacity, which means that I have to set the transparency property to true. Okay, now if I want to see if I have any changes, let's look at this particle. We notice that we can see the particles in the back by looking at the edges of this particle. But if you look closely, you will notice that the black part on the edges has not completely disappeared. I don't know if you can see that in the video, but you will see the black parts more clearly in your project. The black parts didn't disappear completely because the GPU is struggling to know which particles is in the front and which particle is in the back. So we want the GPU to look at the position of the particle on the z-axis to know which of the particle is in the front and which one is in the back. And this will be done by using the depth test property. So we write material the depth test is equal to false. Let's increase the amount of particles. Now as you can see, 
that the black parts completely disappeared, and we can see the particles in the back through the particles in the front. Okay, now we want to change the same background color. The same background color will be black by default, so we want to change the same background color to transparent, and then change the body background color from the CSS. In one of the upcoming lessons, we will talk about the renderer properties, but now we want to use one of these properties, which is the alpha property. So we move inside the WebGL renderer and then write alpha true. So now the same background color became transparent. And inside the CSS, I prepared a linear gradient color for the body. So now the same background will be colored from the CSS file. Okay, now we want to animate these particles to look like as it is a snowfall. And we can animate the particles in the same way we used to animate the cube mesh. So we go inside the animate function. First, I want to do animate particles section and then write points dot rotation dot y is equal to elapsed time. We want to decrease the rotation speed by multiplying the rotation by a number less than 1, for example, 0 0.05. And of course, you can do a rotation on the x-axis. I don't have to tell you that you can do anything inside the HTML, such as writing text or doing a login page, and that will look cool with the particles as a background. But we have a problem, not about the particles, but about the orbit controls. Currently, you can zoom in and zoom out. And also, you can still rotate the particles. You can keep these features if you like them. And if you want to disable them, then we have to see the orbit controls properties. Here we have a property called Enable Zoom. The default value for this property is true, meaning that we can zoom in and zoom out. And if we change it to false, then we can't do zoom in or zoom out. We want to make it false, so we write orbit controls dot enable zoom is equal to false. Also, we want to remove the rotate, so we write orbit controls dot enable rotate is equal to false. So now I remove the rotation and the zoom feature from the orbit controls. Okay. Now the last thing before we end the lesson, we can increase the project performance and almost get the same animation by rotating one element instead of rotating the whole particles. And the element is the camera. So we want to comment out these two lines and animate only the camera, either by rotating it inside the animate function or by auto-rotating the camera from the orbit controls. So we write orbit controls dot auto rotate is equal to true. Let's reduce the rotation speed by writing orbit controls dot auto rotate speed is equal to 0 0.2. So now we are rotating one object, which is the camera, instead of rotating 10,000 particle. So if you want to do a simple particle animation, I prefer you should use this way. That was everything for today, and see you in the next lesson.